Good evening and welcome to the Cabarrus County Board of Education's Monday night business meeting for January the 10th, 2022. We will say welcome to our viewing audience that have joined us live stream. And also we would just like to begin with items under number 4.01 uh, with our opening ceremony because the board has already, we have called the meeting to order and the board has just reconvened from open session. So with that 4.01, we will turn it over to, for the presentation of colors with the Northwest Cabarrus High School color guard. And we will have, um, you can key up please, go ahead. Bart. Thank you. Presenting tonight's colors are members of the Northwest Cabarrus High School Air Force JROTC program, and their personnel includes Cadet First Lieutenant Lacey Wiley, Cadet Senior Airman Banos Rios, Cadet Senior Airman Gabrielle Corey, and Cadet Airman Wyatt Edwards. Please stand. Please join me in the, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will begin with the items under 5.01, which is to set the agenda. And board members, we need to make uh, an amendment <coughs> that we will pull from the consent agenda the calendar revisions. May I have a motion that we pull from the consent agenda the calendar re revisions and then to approve the agenda otherwise as presented? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Blackwell, a second by Mr. Walter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And then we will make that item number 13.02 under the actions. Next, we will move to items under 6.01, which are our impact through education awards. We will ask Mrs. Ronnie Boone uh, to the podium, which is our director of communications, and she will begin those acknowledgments. Good evening. Good evening. Tonight we'll present Impact Through Education Awards to students and staff at Weddington Hills Elementary School and J.M. Robinson High School. Our sponsors of the Impact Awards are our friends at Equitable. At this time, I'd like to invite Emily Satterley and Alex Davidson from Equitable to join me at the front of the room, please. Good evening. Please accept our sincere thanks and gratitude to you and to Equitable for your continued sponsorship of the Impact Through Education Awards. We're so very appreciative that you are helping us to celebrate and recognize our deserving students and staff in this way. Now on to tonight's awards. We'll begin with Weddington Hills Elementary School and would the administrators from Weddington Hills please come forward. <clears throat> oh. 
This is our first honoree from Weddington Hills. Come on in. Is Miss Dolan here? There, there she is. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Will Dobbs, Dobbs, I'm sorry, Will Dobbs, William Dobbs, is a fifth grade student at Weddington Hills Elementary School. He joined the Wildcat family in first grade and has demonstrated excellence in academics and behavior since day one. He takes his responsibilities as a Wildcat seriously. He's an active member of the school's leadership advisory council, and you will often find him packing bags for school events and working hard in the mornings to ensure everything is distributed. Will has been recognized this year as a county winner for the Young Authors Writing Contest, as well as a Class Spelling Bee winner. Outside of school, Will stays busy competing in the school's VEX Robotics Club, Taekwondo, and Community Baseball. Will's character exemplifies the traits we look for in young people. His family supports him daily in his educational journey. The importance of learning and positive character has been instilled in him by his amazing parents and his older sister. Weddington Hills is lucky to have Will as a part of the Wildcat family. They can't, see, they can't wait to see what the future holds for him. Once a Wildcat, always a Wildcat. Congratulations. Good job. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next honoree is Kirsten Gamble. Kirsten, can I get you to stand next to Ms. Dolan, please? There you go. And then family just squish in for us. <laughs> Kirsten Gamble is a wonderful, hardworking, and kind fifth grade student at Weddington Hills. She has been a Weddington Hills Wildcat since beginning her educational journey in kindergarten. Kirsten's favorite subjects in school are math and science. Her favorite things about school are the learning opportunities she has access to, especially those that allow her to work with others and the ones that she gets to spend time with, with her friends. Kirsten is a role model for other students and leads by example in all that she does each day. Outside of school, Kirsten plays tennis, basketball, and swims. As for her future, her dream job would be to become a culinary artist or a financial specialist. Weddington Hills is excited to watch her continue to shine. Once a wildcat, always a wildcat. Congratulations, Kirsten. Congratulations. Good job. Go that way. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next honoree is Mrs. Jacobia Williams. Yep, right there. <laughs> Kobe has been a shining light to the Weddington Hills family for years. Even when she was serving more than one school, she was fully committed to the Weddington Hills students, staff, and families. Her impact on the school is far reaching and meets the needs of the whole child. From providing clothing and food to school supplies and parent resources, her support is never ending. Her passion for equity and inclusion led to staff development, which provided a safe space for difficult conversations and a deeper understanding. She is a willing collaborator and continues to innovate. Most recently, she felt a need to hold support sessions for school's newcomers. This new initiative is helping English language learners to thrive. 
Mrs. Williams' enthusiasm and energy are contagious, and her impact is immeasurable. She is an incredible asset to the Weddington Hills family. Congratulations. 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 Thank you for all you do. She's not here. Okay. So our final honoree from Weddington Hills is Regina Blackman, and she's not here, but I would like to read what was submitted about her. Nurse Regina, as she is affectionately called by the students and staff of Weddington Hills Elementary, is vital to the school family. It goes without saying that the past few years have been extremely demanding on healthcare workers, and Nurse Regina never skipped a beat. She rose to the challenges in keeping students, staff, and families safe, all while retaining her calm presence and grace. Her collaboration with community health resources and agencies keeps the Weddington Hills school community informed and protected. It is evident that she is passionate about the health and safety of others, and she embraces her role with confidence. Nurse Regina's care and positively, Nurse Regina's care has positively impacted <laughs> Weddington Hills Elementary, and her impact goes beyond the school. Is this her? <laughs> Come on in. Come on in. Let's, let me finish reading about you. <laughs> it's okay. Nurse Regina's care has positively impacted Weddington Hills Elementary and her impact goes beyond the school walls to keep the community safe. Weddington Hills Elementary is grateful Nurse, Re Nurse Regina is a wildcat. Congratulations. You made it just in time. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for all you do. <laughs> All right, one okay. more picture with your mic. Go right up there. Next, we're going to move on to J.M. Robinson High School. If any administrators are here, is this Sophia? This is Sophia Miguel. Come on in. It's family, too. Sophia is a hardworking student who is totally immersed in her education and the culture at J.M. Robinson High School. Her respect for teachers allows her to be, be a successful student because she is not afraid to ask questions and advocate for herself. She knows the ins and outs of the school and has never let negativity affect her performance or her positive attitude. She has a thirst for knowledge as evidenced by her 4.28 GPA. She is generous with her time and always willing to help her classmates succeed. Sophia is always polite and friendly to peers and to staff at J.M. Robinson. She is involved in various clubs at the school, holding officer positions in several. Sophia is a leader among her peers and respected by the student body. She is willing to jump in and help in a variety of ways, whether it, whether it is helping with a multicultural dinner or setting up for an event. One can always count on Sophia. Robinson is lucky to have a student with such, stellar, with such a stellar attitude. Congratulations. 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 Good job. Good job. Thank you for being here tonight. Mr. Hobbs, we want to read about your other honorees who aren't able, who aren't able to make it tonight. <laughs> the other Robinson student who is being honored this evening is Jaden Brown. 
Jaden is a kind, dedicated, hardworking senior at J.M. Robinson High School. On a daily basis, he exemplifies what it means to be a great citizen by consistently doing the right thing for people without being nasty, always being respectful of others, and even if he disagrees, leading by example. Academically, Jaden is one of J.M. Robinson's finest. His dedication and hard work have positioned him as one of Robinson's top students. He's currently ranked fifth in his class with a GPA of 4.45. Jaden is helpful and always willing to assist his fellow students in the classroom. He also helps with the CCS VEX summer, summer camps, assisting the younger students who attend the camps. J.M. Robinson is proud to present Jaden with this Impact Through Education Award, and we say congratulations to him. Now for the staff members from J.M. Robinson, the first honoree is Mrs. Dale Janis. Mrs. Janis is an amazing staff member who works tirelessly to assist her English language learner students. She is an advocate for all students and understands how to get things done. There are no roadblocks that will get in her way to do what's best for children. She works with students in different settings and creates engaging activities for them. She works closely with the Student Services Department to ensure that the ELL students are having their needs met and that their upcoming schedules are what is best for them. She always makes sure that none of her students fall through the cracks and are on track to graduate. We say congratulations to Mrs. Janice as well. And our final Robinson honoree is Ms. Tyra Cunningham. As the Student Services Secretary and Registrar, Ms. Cunningham is the first person many Robinson families see. She's always professional and helpful. As a coworker, she makes many staff members' days better because of her positive energy and smile. She is an essential member of the J.M. Robinson Student Services Department. She stays up to date on all paperwork associated with student records and transcripts. Whenever a staff member inquires about a student or a situation, Ms. Cunningham is always there with the information or knows exactly where to access it. If she doesn't know the answer or how to do something, she finds out and is efficient in the process. Ms. Cunningham definitely goes above and beyond in her role in order to meet the needs of J.M. Robinson High School. When staff members are asked about Ms. Cunningham, they all say the same thing. She's helpful, kind, a hard worker, professional, and knowledgeable and we say congratulations to her on her Impact Through Education Award. And I'm gonna give all of these plaques to you, Mr. Hobbs, to get to your honorees. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. So congratulations to those that were with us tonight and those that were unable to be, um, be so. And uh, Ms. Boone, I think you're gonna stay with us for 6.02. Yes. The 2021-2022 Holiday E-Card Contest winners. Yes. Dr. Kapicki, would you like to come help me pass out the certificates? So last month, Dr. Kapicki announced the winners of our 11th annual Holiday E-Card Contest. And each year, our district sponsors this contest to give students an opportunity to design holiday greetings that Dr. Kapicki will use in his official holiday greeting for the district. The design theme for 2021 was peace, love, and kindness. The top designs were selected based on originality, theme, and overall design in two categories, traditional and digital. We received close to 200 entries from students in all grade levels. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing you to the talented artist whose designs were chosen. I also want to say a quick word of thanks to our friends at Great Wolf Lodge, who once again have, have generously donated prizes to the winning artist. Each student will receive a splash pass for four from Great Wolf Lodge. So let's give Angie Brown, who's the general manager of Great Wolf Lodge, and her team a round of applause for sponsoring this. <laughs> And we have two students who aren't able, who were not able to meet, make it tonight. So I'm going to start in the traditional design category. The first student, and he was unable to attend, is Noah Highsmith. Noah is a student at Weddington Hills Elementary School. Our second, um, our other, our other students from the traditional design category 
Jenny Cree Zalin Maui from Hickory Ridge Middle School, and Ava Rakoff from Concord High School. Come on in. That's Ava. From our digital design category, Kayla Elsa Sean from Cox Mill Elementary, and Lily Chapman from Hickory Ridge Middle School. Okay, okay girls, could I get you out of? come together just a little bit so we can get another picture of you all. Ms. Penn, where, where can we find a copy of the artwork? Can we see it? Is it on the website? Uh, the artwork is on, on our website. We <coughs> shared it last month, um, but it's on our website. Um, and the, if you go just to our web address and then backslash holiday e-card contest, you'll find it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Oh, and I neglected to mention that the high school winner for the digital design category who also could not be here tonight is Alexa Moon. So we say congratulations to her too. Thank you, Mrs. Boone. And of course, congratulations again to all those that were with us and those that were with not, that were not. We will move on to 6.03, the Hilbush Ford Teacher of the Month, and we will have Dr. Marion Bish back to the podium. Good evening. Good evening. We would like to invite um, our Hilbush Ford Teacher of the Month and any administrators with her to come in, please. This is Mary Pickard, a kindergarten teacher at Hickory Ridge Elementary. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce our Hilbush Ford Teacher of the Month for January. As always, we want to offer our sincere thanks and gratitude to Mr. Tim Vaughn and Hilbush Ford for their continued generosity and their sponsorship of this award. Our Hilbush Ford Teacher of the Month for January is, is Mary Pickard. Did I say that correctly? And she is a kindergarten teacher at Hickory Ridge Elementary School. So I would like to note that Mr. Vaughn and his prize patrol have already visited Ms. Pickard in her classroom last week to present her with her check and her award. Tonight though, we want to present her certificate and our heartfelt nomination and share with you what a parent submitted about Ms. Pickard. My son, a kindergartner, is on the spectrum and suffers from sensory disorder. As a mom, I was terrified to send him to school in fear of him being treated differently. When I first spoke to Ms. Pickard on the phone, we discussed my concerns. I was so scared that I just overwhelmed her with information. However, after the open house, my fears diminished. Ms. Pickard drew some Pokemon characters for my son. You see, I told her how much he liked them during our phone conversation. He carried those characters around the house for over a week. She wanted him to know that she cared about him, even before they met. As the year progressed, she would reach out to me and ask for my thoughts and for insight. She also reached out to others to find techniques to help him in the classroom and socially with his friends. She went above and beyond to make sure he felt safe and loved. The growth I've seen in my son has been overwhelming. Recently, we went on a field trip where I met the mother of another classmate. She told me that her daughter instructed her not to be too loud because it would upset my son. In the classroom, his friends often grab the noise-canceling headphones for him or comfort him when he's on sensory overload. He's not seen as different 
And that's all thanks to this amazing teacher. Ms. Pickard, from all of us, thank you for all you do to welcome students into your classroom, to make them feel safe, to make them feel loved, for meeting them where they are. Congratulations on your selection as Cabarrus County Schools Hilbush Ford Teacher of the Month. Just turn around. Congratulations. Thank you for all you do. And we will keep you for 6.04 Teacher Assistant of the Year recognition. So we'd like to invite Mary Beth Earp and any of the administrators from Cox Mill High School. You'll come right here, Miss Earp. We'd like to offer our congratulations to Mary Beth Earp. She is the Structured Learning Teacher Assistant at Cox Mill High School and has been selected as the 2021-22 Teacher Assistant of the Year for Cabarrus County Schools. Ms. Earp joined Cabarrus County in 2010 as the Structured Learning Teacher Assistant at Hickory Ridge High School. She then has worked at Cox Mill High since 2012. She earned a bachelor's degree from Converse University. According to her principal, Mrs. Earp cares deeply about her students and always goes above and beyond to help them. She and her colleagues have worked together for several years and provide their students with the compassion and support that they need. They count on her to jump in at a moment's notice. She's always ready to help. She's been with Cox Mill High School for many years and we cannot imagine our school without her. Rachel Smith, the structured learning classroom teacher, shares this about Mrs. Earp. She always maintains a positive, professional attitude, even during difficult situations. She goes above and beyond in all areas. She's always willing to be flexible, despite the many challenges that our classroom faces, and steps in as needed without having to be asked. I would not be able to do my job without her help and her friendship. Ashley Adams, parent of Braden, had this to say. Miss Earp has been a ray of sunshine in Braden's life at school. She's been with him for seven years and made it a point to connect with him on his interests and likes from the very beginning. They bonded over those interests. It helps during the hard times, whether she would take a walk with him, sing Disney songs, or play a game. We're thankful for Ms. Earp and the impact she's had on Braden even during his vocational work opportunity. She deserves Teacher Assistant of the Year every year. Faculty and staff at Cabarrus County Schools nominate and vote for a Teacher Assistant of the Year award and a panel including the current Principal of the Year, Assistant Principal of the Year, and Teacher Assistant of the Year select the district winner based on an interview and artifact presentation. Dr. Kapicki and I were able to surprise Mrs. Earp at the school a, a few weeks ago with her award in her classroom with her students and that was quite the honor to be able to be there with you. So congratulations to Mary Beth Earp, our 2021-22 Cabarrus County Schools uh, Teacher Assistant of the Year. And if you will come right here, I think Mr. Martin might want a picture. Mm -hmm. Congratulations and thank you for being with us tonight. Board members, we will move to 6.05, new board intern recognitions, and we will ask board member Adcock to take the podium. 
Okay, thank you so much. I have the privilege tonight of introducing our second semester board intern students. And just to give you a little bit of information about these students, they're selected through an application process and they have to answer questions. And both of them said they wanted new leadership opportunities within Cabarrus County Schools. So we're really excited to get them started into the program. And a few of the things that they'll be learning this year will just be having tours at some of our main facilities. They'll get to be interviewed and uh, also ask interview questions to our superintendent and other awesome things. So I'm gonna invite them if they'll come up to the podium. They're gonna introduce themselves as Camille Rogers and Jonathan Luke. Dr. Preps. Okay. Good evening. My name is Camille Rogers, and I am a junior at Cox Mill High School, and I'm very excited to begin this um, internship. My name is Jonathan Luke from the Early College of Technology High, and I am in 12th grade, and I am in, and it has been a pleasure to select me for being part of this internship. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, Ms. Adcock. Now we will move to 7.01 and start with the approval of the minutes. May I have a motion that the board approve the minutes for the open session meetings for December the 6th, 2021. December the 13th, 2021, or are there any comments or noted corrections? So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Adcock. Second. A second by Ms. Blackwell. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Would you key up, please? Did you want the report from... Actually, I was going to move those to February. Oh, and okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I talked to most of the board members. I probably didn't even ask you that when we were on the telephone. Are you okay with that, or would you like to give a report? Oh, no. I'll wait. For, okay. That'll be Some fine. Some weren't quite ready, and that was okay to move it to February. Are you okay with that? Or yes, that'll okay. be fine. That Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you for reminding me. So well, that, with that, we will move to items under number 8.01. We will have our guest speakers that will address the board. So bear with me and give me a few minutes to uh, notice the... Um, people that are here, the speakers, and also that are viewing with us. In accordance with Board Policy 2310, a part of each business meeting will be set aside for citizens to address the board through public comment. Each speaker will receive three minutes to present comments. An individual speaking on behalf of a group may be allowed to speak for five minutes at the discretion of the board chair. Speakers may sign up with the board clerk via email at boardclerk at cabarrus.k12.nc.us or in person no later than 12 p.m. noon, the day of the regularly scheduled monthly business meeting. Speakers must provide contact information, including their name, group name, if applicable, relationship to Cabarrus County Schools, their address and phone number, and list the general education related topic of their presentation for the board minutes. During the public comment period, the board chair will recognize speakers in the order in which they signed in or emailed. Substitute speakers will not be permitted and speakers may not donate any portion of their time to another speaker. If a speaker is unable to present all of his or her information within the specified time limit, the speaker may provide the board with the additional information in written form. If an unusually large number of people request to speak, a majority of the board may decide to reduce the time for each individual or to require the designation of a spokesperson for each group of persons supporting or opposing the same positions. At any time, the board may establish additional procedures to ensure that public comment sessions proceed in an efficient and orderly manner. The board chair will read or distribute a general statement at the beginning of the public comment period outlining the acceptable procedures. In consultation, in consultation with the board attorney, the board chair may prepare additional guidelines consistent with this policy. Statements reasonably perceived to be disruptive or imminently threatening to the orderly operation of the meeting shall not be permitted. Any limitation or public comments shall be viewpoint neutral. The board chair will have the authority to rule the speaker out of order. 
a person who willfully interrupts, disturbs, or disrupts an official meeting and who, upon being directed to leave the meeting by the board chair, willfully refuses to leave the meeting is guilty of a class two misdemeanor pursuant to general statute 143-31817. And with that, I will begin with the speakers. And the first one we have is a Mr. Sean Turner. Is Mr. Turner in the room? Great. Good evening. Your Good mic evening. is keyed and you are ready to proceed. Great. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Sean Turner. I'm a product of Cabarrus County Schools. I have a seven-year-old at Pittsgrove Road Elementary School and a seven-month-old that will eventually attend Cabarrus County Schools. It is safe to say that I'm heavily invested in this school system for the foreseeable future. I would like to start with something that occurred during the October meeting. During this meeting, a gentleman named Justin committed a portion of his time to pray for each and every one of you in this room. I found it incredibly disrespectful that individuals sitting behind him immediately picked up their cell phones and began working on their laptops once he bowed his head. See it for yourself in the video at 47 minutes and 46 seconds. With your believer, whether you are a believer in Christ or not, I felt it was a slap on that man's face as he was doing what he felt he was called to do for your benefit alone. Moving on, a few months ago, I saw a picture on social media of a board member attending a college football game, unmasked. I did not know whether to laugh or throw my phone across the room. There I sat looking at a woman who has advocated to have my son breathe his own exhaust for eight hours a day, enjoying herself surrounded by thousands of rowdy sports fans. You could tell me it's because you're vaccinated, you could tell me because masks weren't mandated at that event, or because you were outside. Frankly, I don't care, and neither do concerned parents in this county. As an elected official, you clearly could benefit from a class on optics. Time and time again throughout this whole COVID ordeal, we have witnessed rules for thee, but not for me. As elected officials demand one thing, then are shown doing the exact opposite. The constant attempts to mandate masks on these children is exhausting. I watched one meeting where you held up a page of the Charlotte Observer. You proudly pointed to it as you made your claim that your concerns are backed by the newspaper. I can currently point to CNN's medical analyst, Dr. Leanna Wynn, who just on January 3rd said that cloth masks are, quote, useless in preventing the spread of coronavirus, unquote. But where would that get us? When you only look at and present things that prove your point, it's not research. That's called confirmation bias, and you're not fooling anyone, especially not me. I often find myself asking, what on earth did you guys talk about before COVID? It is literally the main discussion every month. I am COVID exhausted. The members of the community are COVID exhausted. Most importantly, the children are exhausted. I shook my head in disbelief last week when I heard a spokesperson from the Cabarrus Health Alliance beg, as some of you put it, for two more weeks of masks. We're currently on day 660 something of 14 days to slow the curve. Stop moving the goalpost, except that this is something we as a community will have to live with and let's focus on education rather than sneeze prevention. I know these words are not likely to sway your position when it comes to the vote tonight, as I'm sure your minds are already made up. However, I would like to tell you that the eyes of the county are upon you. There's an election coming up in November, and I assure you that your ability to use common sense and critical thinking will be remembered. The last thing I want to do is run for the school board. I'm not jealous of any of you. However, if that is what it takes to move this board in the direction of education rather than watch the political theatrics at the expense of my child's future, I will certainly do it. That being said, my name is Sean Turner. I'm a Christian, a husband, a father, a United States Marine. If you see my name on the ballot in November, you know where I stand. I'll be praying for each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Speaker number two is Stephanie Bloxham. Thing. Good evening. I started to say I don't even have to tell you. you I was just going exactly. to say I wouldn't even uh, miss the opportunity to speak about masks. So when you guys finish, there is a gift outside for you guys, a COVID survival kit. And in it will be one of these pictures. I did not realize that I could not hand this to you, so I apologize that it's so small. But this is a picture of Defense Secretary Austin Lloyd. He is fully vaxxed, fully boosted, everything you can imagine, wearing a face mask, face shield, outdoors. Do you think COVID caught this guy? Sure did. We're all gonna get this variant. The basic reproduction ratio of Omicron is seven to 10. Delta was five to six, and the original Rona was two to three. So go ahead and circle back in your own time to find out what that really means, but I'll put it in layman's term. It's gonna spread like wildfire. Vaccines, masks are not going to stop this. If it's such an emergency, why is Cabarrus County not under a mask mandate? 
Mecklenburg County is. They went under mask mandate August 31st. And if you compare their numbers to ours, we're way too close to be putting our children in masks before we're asking adults to be in masks constantly. Their numbers are actually, we're, so we beat them by 2%. We have 2% less positivity rate than them right now. They have more uh, va fully vaccined in their county. Um, if the numbers were really close, you, I don't think that you guys have the decision in what is best for my child. So if this spread, if it's so way spread, why is Cooper not mandating it again? Probably because he has seen mask mandates in schools be struck down in the courts in other states. So he's asking you guys to do it. The numbers inside our schools showed that mask optional was working. However, Cabarrus Health Alliance wanted to take something that was working and replace it with something that sounds good. We have to recognize that numbers with the children are different than numbers against adults out in public. Referring back to the picture I gave you, imagine this man's discipline. I'm sure that it's probably pretty, pretty serious, right? He doesn't tug at his mask, make sure it never falls under his nose. He has done every single thing right. He still got COVID. Our kids don't wear masks to the standard that this man does. All right, biggest thing is with this uh, COVID relief that you, package that you guys are gonna get, um, I think we've forgotten to take care of each other. So really quickly, I'm gonna tell you what's gonna be in there. A bottle of body armor. And what I mean by body armor is things to protect you from COVID, which the experts should have told you all along, which is whole food balanced diet. So there's a piece of fruit in there. Sunscreen, cause you need to get outside and have fresh air, get some vitamin D. A squish ball to reduce your stress. I suggest you turn the six o'clock news off. Bedtime tea to help you get a good night's rest. A block to remind us to exercise. Walk around the block, ride your bike around the block. Soup and crackers, because that's how we used to deal with the good old flu. And last but not least, the only kind of face mask you should be wearing. And I guess you can probably assume that it's a facial mask, like a cosmetic mask. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Speaker number three, Elizabeth Rory. Good evening. Good evening. Hey, Elizabeth, are you speaking for your yeah, group? Yeah, for Moss Liberty. Okay, yes. just making sure. Okay. Good evening, board chair, school board members, superintendent, Dr. Kapicki, and our community. Thank you for this time to speak today. I'll reintroduce myself to the audience that may be attending for the first time. My name is Elizabeth Rory, Rory and my children go to Cabarrus County Public Schools. I'm also the chair for Moms for Liberty, which is a nonpartisan group which speaks for parents' rights in the public schools. Ter teachers, parents, and the community all play an important role in our children's education. From the perspective of the parents and the community will be the perspective I give today. In August 2021, Governor Cooper gave an order for all school boards to vote monthly regarding mask wearing. Until this abuse of power is rescinded, I and my group will be here to report why we know mask optional is the best vote to make. Let me begin by refuting the presentation by the Cabarrus Health Alliance given last week. Our community was appalled at their, at their um, appalled and disappointed to say the least on their behavior. They gave very unprofessional behavior. There was fear mongering and pushy talk I would easily consider bullying. I heard the hospitals were full and overburdened how the hospitals are overwhelmed with COVID, how they are seeing more cases of illness because people were not masking. But the COVID numbers were not that high at the time so the, they proceeded to beg you, the school board members, to do a two week optional to week mask till the numbers might go up. So they were just wanting and begging. It was very, very discer discerning to watch. This kind of behavior was not help helpful to our community. So where are we now with COVID, mass vaccinations and quarantine? There is no new news regarding COVID other than, again, we got another article saying that Omicron is, does not work with cloth mask. I emailed this article to the school board prior to come here tonight. So wearing mask is not working for children. Masks are causing chaos and confusion. I have two personal examples I like to share. So I have a son in middle school and he, they're allowed to take a water break. 
so he took his water break, pulled his mask down, took his water, and then pulled it back up. Before he pulled it back up, he got in trouble, got written up. I asked the teacher for a concession and just give him benefit of the doubt, and they said they were not going to give benefit of the doubt. That's just one example of where this all leads to. It's pointing fingers at each other with all these rules. The other time was uh, last week I was just informed by um, my child that the teacher was giving um, advice on mask and on COVID guidelines and vaccinations. We don't need to discuss these things in the classroom and I did inform the principal on both of these occasions. So and they were handled but this is where it's leading to. We're arguing about things that should not be argued about in the schools. And then when I came here tonight on the way here to school, um, to the school board meeting, I got a phone call and it was from the middle school and they said, we've got 10 cases of COVID that were tested positive last week. And they said, but then they said, proceeded to say, but only five were last week, five were from the holiday. So my question to the board and to other people about numbers is, which number is that? Are they going to consider that being 10 cases of positive for throwing the numbers tonight? Or is it going to be five number five for the number? These things do matter because we keep getting in that metric system where there's two positive, two negative. So these numbers do matter and they're arbitrary and we're seeing that they're being arbitrary. Playing this game of COVID and metrics is like playing a game of gotcha. First, it was uh, if we wear the mask, then we won't have to quarantine as much then we do what we're supposed to do and then we come back and we're like well, why did we have to quarantine so much oh the time limit for is 15 minutes again it's like we're playing a game of gotcha there's only 15 minutes so we didn't we were not told this before we need the transparency from this board and we need transparency from the Cabarrus Health Alliance to the school board members who voted for mask optional we do thank you for your questions we thank you for your thoughts we thank you for your research to the school board members who vote mask required we want to ask you to not publicly call out other members who are voting mask optional it was done last week and we really are trying to work through this without in a professional manner without calling each other out and also too like my prior speaker said we are all trying to figure this out and even if you vote for mask optional then why do you not wear a mask when you come to the school board meeting thank you for your time thank you for your um consideration in all of this thank you speaker number four is chris rubez Good evening, and feel free to correct me. It's Rubez, you got it. Very good, you may Thank get you. started. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, my name is Chris Rubez, and I am a father to a young child in your district. I am a husband to an OR nurse in your city, and I am a senior data, uh, senior data engineer, among many other things. <laughs> I have worked with data for nearly 16 years in both the public and private sectors. I am an expert in my field. The information I analyze, aggregate, and report can mean raises or bonuses for employees or layoffs. Executives look to me to trust that I know what I'm doing because if I'm wrong or I make a mistake, lives are impacted. Now you are being tasked with something very similar to the executives I work with, but much more detrimental. You're being asked to listen to the experts in a room uh, 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 to make a decision that will affect people's lives and their families. Now you heard from medical experts. We can hear now that people don't necessarily trust experts now. Tuesday night, and, and basically they were overwhelmingly clear. Masks work and it is imperative to have our children and teachers universally masked to keep our hospitals from being overwhelmed. You've heard it many times. Again, I'm a senior data engineer. Data is my job. Healthcare is the job of the folks that told you our children should be wearing masks in school. And half of you scoffed in their faces and suggested that it was your opinion that masks don't work. Your opinion, frankly, doesn't matter. That's why you brought in the experts, right? So please stop making this a political issue where it's not needed. 
The other night, a doctor told you that if someone has a heart attack or gets in a car wreck, they're not going to be seen in a hospital if the hospitals are overwhelmed. This is already happening all over the country. And as the doctor told you Tuesday night, we're pretty close to happening here. Now, for some reason, you guys think that Omicron is mild. Okay, it's not. It's milder than Delta. It's, uh, I don't know if you remember the original coronavirus strain, because we've been through a couple now. The, uh, the 98.4% survival rate. That means that 1.6% people die. It sounds like a small number, but 1.6% is 1 in 62 people that catch coronavirus die. Very simple math. All right, Ms. Blackwell, last week you asked the healthcare professionals about overestimated Omicron numbers. You were right. Initially, the numbers were overestimated due to testing bias and quick turnaround of data. Once they got more data in, it was recalculated and it was lowered. We are learning about these things in real time. It's burning us all out. We get it. All right. But as new information comes in, we have to adjust. That said, due to the exponential growth of Omicron, it's now up to 95%. 95% of all cases. We're up now at 12.5 times higher and four weeks ago in North Carolina. In North Carolina alone, we have 12 and a half times more cases. It's the highest it's been. You guys have abandoned our children, our hospitals, and our community. And tonight, you have a chance to rectify that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here. Speaker number five is Sam Treadaway. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Your mic is keyed and ready to go. Very good. Uh, good evening. And first and foremost, I want to thank you for your time and commitment to our students and our community. I know it's not an easy task these days. You'll be probably uh, relieved to know that I'm not going to talk about COVID or masks. I'm going to talk about calendars. And I was actually relieved to see that you moved the calendar amendment for the spring to the discussion part of the agenda. I'm glad to hear that because one of the things I wanted to point out that may or may not be a part of your discussion is that, um, as you know, uh, it's, it's, un, it's, it's hard times in our schools as well. And our teachers are repeatedly asked to cover for each other. And as a result, uh, one of the few things our principals can do for them is to offer some flex time. And um, uh, what, through no fault of anyone, at least no, through no uh, fault of anyone in this room, uh, our primary has been moved. We have very few options left calendar-wise, but the, uh, the recommendation from the calendar committee does not allow any use of flex time for our teachers. So I, I would hope that you would at least take that in consideration when you're looking at that. Uh, I, and again, I know there's not a lot of good options. The other, the other calendar issue I'd like to bring up is something that uh, people of a certain age can remember when our schools did not start nearly as late in August as they do now. And I, uh, due to the tourism lobby in, I think it was 2004, the, the, what we currently refer to as the calendar law was passed and signed into law. Um, I, I would like to see us as a community and especially as a board to at least uh, revisit that, not necessarily here, but let our legislators know that we would like to have the options and the flexibility to have a calendar that meets our needs. Um, we started exams today. We used to start exams before the holiday break, if you recall. And so I would just ask, I, I think you should be making those decisions about our calendar, not necessarily the General Assembly. So. Uh, those are the two calendar issues I just wanted to draw your attention to, and I hope that we will continue to. Uh, it's my understanding that the House of Representatives is tired of all the waiver requests. It's the Senate where the uh, lobby is maybe a little more, has, has a little more impact. But I hope as a board that we can not necessarily have a resolution, but that we can continue to ask our legislators to return that re responsibility back to the board. Thank you. Thank you. And Sam, I'm going to take a privilege as the board chair. Mm -hmm. I know you may not stay. Mm -hmm. That argument has been on the floor many times. There are several house bills that oh, I speak, know. I know. as you I know, know. you've I been know. a part I of know. that. To it, that, that is not anything we have control on, and we I have totally battled understand. that every year. I, I, just, was the, <coughs> I was elected in 04, so that was one of the first right, things that right, we, we right. had to take on. And it's thank you. It's been you. a challenge every year, but thank you for acknowledging. Mm -hmm. 
Speaker number six is Catherine Whiteford. Good evening. Good evening. Your mic is keyed and ready to go. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine Whiteford. I'm a Cabarrus County resident and candidate for the North Carolina House District 73. The science behind the efficacy of cloth masks is dubious at best. Studies out of Oxford show little significant difference in transmission with cloth masks. A study of healthcare workers in over 1,600 hospitals show cloth masks filtering out no more than 3% of particulates. Now, N95 masks have been shown to be a good defense against the spread of particulates, but we're not talking about distributing N95 masks to every student in Cabarrus County Schools. Unfortunately, we're in a time where misinformation is twice as transferable as COVID, and people have been led to believe that all masks are equal. Now, we're having this conversation because some say if COVID cases hit this level, we'll need to mask children, while ignoring the facts on the ground. Folks, we legislate based on facts and current data, not based on fear, generalities, and incorrect data. This isn't the COVID we were talking about six months or so, or a year ago. I myself had COVID back in fall of 2020. Is it more transferable? Sure. And again, cloth masks are going to stop it. Is it as symptomatic or likely to cause hospitalization? No, according to an article from Yale Medical, Omicron is 50% less likely to be symptomatic than Delta. So the conversation we are having is whether or not we should implement a measure which will do nothing to spread the, of a COVID strain that is weakest of any we've seen yet. While I'm not a parent, I do plan on starting a family one day in this community. I'd like that family to live and grow in a community that respects their rights as individuals to make their own health decisions and where the government isn't implementing senseless restrictions on their liberty in the name of fear and pseudoscience. For that reason, I oppose mask mandates, and I am in favor of each individual choosing what is best for them and their family. And I ask, that, and I hope that the board will as well. Again, my name is Catherine Whiteford, and I ask that the board will defend the rights of our families and say no to mask mandates. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number seven, and our last speaker is Abdul Ali. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair. Good evening, school board members, and thank you for the opportunity to address you. Uh, I watched the last school board meeting, and I think I speak for a lot of people in this community when I say that there's a lot of questions about the metrics behind this virus. When you've got to come up with this crazy dividing the quotient of the people tested by the number of folks who farted in the left wind by the people who got a test in the third, when you got to come up with these equations, it sounds like you're gaming the people. What we need to know is who's got it, who's recovered and how many people have died. A lot of people in this community want to know, when are we going to start talking about something that has a less than 1% chance of killing you as something that's not dangerous? There was also a statement made at this last school board meeting that these Cabarrus Health Alliance folks were here to beg you all to do something. I can remember in my study of history a time where medical professionals told me I was less than a human being and that was the approved science of the day. There's a lot more out there than the World Health Organization and, CA and uh, the, the CDC and people need to, to know that and you guys have, I think, asked the right questions about that. Also, in my opinion, I could be wrong here, but the community is seeing a logical disconnect. Does this virus know when you're eating, drinking, coming up to a podium to talk? Why would a medical professional who is scared to death, the lady said she wears a mask in her own house, why would these people take a mask off to talk and then put it back on as if this virus is smart enough to know that? We are sick and tired as a community of hearing about this virus. You guys are elected to educate, make sure our children are educated. We have a loss of learning happening. We have mental uh, things that we can't even begin to compound. I do not have school age children anymore, but I can't imagine my child not being able to see a smile on another child's face. What is the long-term effect of these babies not being able to be emotionally connected to their peers and their friends? Finally, the last thing I heard was this was not politically motivated, and that was disingenuous at best because it is on record that people in leadership at Cabarrus Health Alliance are funding left-leaning organizations and PACs like the Stop Republicans PAC. It's time that you guys focus on education. You, it's time that you focus on making sure that our children, we're creating a successful working class 
community in Cabarrus County, please, enough with the mask already. Let these children get to learning. Vote mask optional. And if parents want to send their kids to school with a napkin with a rubber band around it thinking it's going to do something, let them. But that's all I've got. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Okay, board members, that concludes our public comment section. We will move to 9.01 and we will begin with the CCS Spotlight on Educators. Our Teacher of the Year, Ashton Berry, will join us at the podium. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair and board members. Thank you so much for another opportunity <coughs> to highlight the amazing things happening in classrooms across the Cabarrus County School District with another CCS Educator Spotlight. Here in CCS, we believe that it is so important to showcase the fact that our teachers continue to strive for and achieve excellence each and every day through their pedagogy and practice. Before I go any further, I'd like to thank Ms. Leanne Havely, CCS Curriculum and Instruction Coordinator, for collaborating with me and making this month's Educator Spotlight possible. This month's Spotlight features over 70 fantastic teachers from each of our CCS middle and high schools. CC Griffin STEM Middle, Concord Middle, Harold E. Winkler Middle School, Harris Road Middle, Hickory Ridge Middle, J. N. Freeze Middle, Mount Pleasant Middle, Northwest Cabarrus STEM Middle, Cabarrus Tech Early College, Central Cabarrus High School, Concord High School, Cox Mill High School, Early College High School, Hickory Ridge High School, J.M. Robinson High School, Mount Pleasant High School, Northwest Cabarrus High School, West Cabarrus High School, CCS Opportunity Middle and High Schools, and Royal Oaks School of the Arts. This year, the Curriculum and Instruction Department launched the second three-year cycle of the TLT, Teaching and Learning Team, a collaborative system-wide professional learning opportunity. Four cohorts of teachers from each middle school and high school are learning about lesson study, the value of collaborative planning and best practices in the classroom. The cohorts include sixth grade, sixth grade social studies, seventh grade ELA or English language arts, eighth grade science, sixth grade math, world history, biology, math one, and English one. On September 29th, teachers and administrators met for a kickoff at J.M. Robinson High School, where they unpacked lesson study and prepared for their first iteration. Social studies and math cohorts completed their first round at J.N. Freeze Middle School on November 9th and 10th, and English language arts and science cohorts completed their first round on December 7th and 8th at C.C. Griffin Middle School. These cohorts spent two days exploring lesson study as a professional learning tool and collaboratively planning a lesson for their respective courses. The designed lessons focused on best practices in their discipline, our locally designed curriculum, and their own expertise. On the second day, each cohort team taught their designed lesson to two classes at J.N. Freeze Middle School and C.C. Griffin Middle School. Ms. Havely explained that it was amazing to watch the engagement and joy of 30 children as they responded to having up to 10 teachers in their classroom engaging with them at once as they explored their content and engaged in meaningful, relevant, and authentic discussion with their peers. After teaching the lessons, the, cohort reflect, the cohorts reflected on their practice and prepared for their next iteration of lesson study, which will take place in February and March of this year. High school cohorts will complete their first round in February and March of this year as well. This is a really exciting and purposeful opportunity, and the teachers who are participating are leaders and innovators in CCS, their schools, and their classrooms. I'd like to take a moment to personally congratulate and thank each and every one of these fantastic CCS educators for their unwavering dedication to their students and public education. Our school district is better because each and every one of you are in it, and we are so grateful for you. You are all incredible and irreplaceable assets to Cabarrus County Schools. Thank you. Thank you. It is always great to hear your positive report on what's going on out there. Thank you very much. 
Okay, and with that, we will move on to items under 10, and we'll start with 10.0, which are the board chair and superintendent comments. Number one, we're going to, I always seem to forget to do this, and it's, it's such an important piece. We want to thank and tell them how much we appreciate the SROs that are always with us during our meetings. Thank you for being here with us, each and every one of you. And board members, there was a form at your um, seat that says password manager registration. We know we've all had some issues with emails and um, you know that's been real challenging. The password change that happens uh, can be a little bit difficult to navigate. So if you'll just follow these guidelines, they pre prepare those for us and then if there's any issues, either give myself a call, email, or we will uh, ask Dane to work us through it once again. So just make sure that if you do have problems, you let us know. Second, or third, actually, uh, it's, it's a time that we need to clarify some misinformation that was stated to the media over the weekend by a board member who also sent out some survey results uh, from a non-Cabarrus uh, County School source to board members this morning. Um, it is extremely important uh, that information from a board member, which carries a lot of weight uh, when, they, when things are stated, that we all be very cognizant of what we state to the media and to the public. So at this point in time, uh, I've asked Dr. Kapiki to give us a report on some of the items that were discussed, and he is going to join several cabinet members <coughs> at the podium to go over some reports that has been gathered for the board members this evening. So I will turn it over to Dr. Kapiki. Thank you, Ms. Grimsley. Before we get into that, I would just like to highlight a few items um, in the Cabarrus County School System. And I want to begin tonight by congratulating the 25 teachers who recently renewed or earned their National Board Certification. Cabarrus County currently has 241 National Board Certified Teachers. Again, that number is 241 National Board Certified Teachers. It speaks to the excellence uh, that many of you have spoken to this evening that exists in our <coughs> classrooms with outstanding teachers that are dedicated to perfecting their craft. Um, the National Board Certified process in, is intensive, it takes a lot of preparation, a lot of discipline for our teachers to go through this process, and I commend them for their efforts to do that. I salute them and in, in their commitment and their dedication to their profession in getting nationally board certified. It also lends to the North Carolina state itself. North Carolina leads the nation in the number of National Board Certified Teachers with 24,536 of them. So the Cabarrus County Schools teachers are contributing to that overall number in the state and leading the nation amongst those who are nationally board certified. It speaks to the excellence that we have in our classrooms and I thank our teachers for their dedication. I'd also again like to congratulate the following schools and before I do this I want to highlight that these awards again are representative of the great administrators, great support staff, and great teachers that we have in the buildings in Cabarrus County Schools. Congratulations to the following Cabarrus County Schools for making the top 20 best public schools in the Charlotte area list for 2022 that's published by Niche. They are Cox Mill Elementary School, Harris Road Middle School, J.N. Freeze Middle School, Cabarrus Kannapolis Early College High School, and Cox Mill High School. Additionally, 25 other Cabarrus County schools made the entire list. To determine the top public schools, Niche took into account factors such as state test scores, college readiness, graduation rates, SAT, ACT scores, teacher quality, and high school ratings. Now alone tonight, I've mentioned 30 schools out of 43 that are included on this list. Again, it speaks to the quality education that our students are receiving because we have outstanding teachers, support staff, and administrators in those schools. They continue to stand above, above the rest of their, their peers in the state and in the nation. I commend them for their work. I'd like to remind folks that our high school students began their first semester of final exams today, and the exams will continue this week. And our high school students will also be dismissed early from school this week. Other important dates to keep in mind are Monday, January 17th, which is Dr. Martin Luther King Day. It is a holiday. There will be no school in session that day. Tuesday, January 18th is a <coughs> teacher work day. And Wednesday, January 19th, our students return to school. 
to follow up on what Mrs. Grimsley said this evening, I'd like to remind folks that it's important for our board and our community to have a current understanding of our vacancies, teacher absences, substitute status, as our district continues to navigate these uncharted pandemic waters. So I've asked some of our directors this evening from various departments and cabinet leaders to share the status in their departments. And they're gonna update you on the situation in their, in their departments. Prior to them speaking, I wanna remind folks that we are not unique. And I know there was some information that was released to the press this, this, uh, this weekend. I can tell you, no one spoke to me and no one asked me any of this information. I did not speak to anyone in the news media and nobody asked me um, for any verification of any numbers that they were given. So I can tell you that when I saw it, um, I can state that what Mrs. Grimsley said was definitely accurate in the sense that we are definitely experiencing substitute issues and problems that we continue to come up with creative and innovative ways to, to cover our classes. Um, and that is through the substitute pool that we have, that is the t our teachers covering classes, that is administrators covering classes, so be it. And we will continue to do that. Um, does not mean that we don't have a problem, that we don't have issues that we're facing every single day. We do. We have an employee shortage. There's no question about that. We continue, we have continued, we said that and stated that. We need bus drivers. We need cafeteria workers. We need teachers. We need facilities and custodians. We need many people to um, help us in, in the Cabarrus County school system. So in saying that, we continue to recruit. We continue to go out there and promote and ask people to apply and, and try and hire as quickly as we can qualified people and we want the best people so when i say qualified people you, you we want the best qualified people to walk into our school systems that doesn't mean every single day we're hiring 5 10 15 people at a time it's a process um, i want to commend our teachers i know you're stressed i know you're being asked to do an awful lot i value and appreciate and i can speak for this board when i say they value and appreciate you as well um, I'm going to allow our, our folks to come up and speak now, and then I'm going to ask our board for permission to do something for our teachers to help them as they continue to cover classes. And, and, and we, I think we have a creative suggestion uh, based on some of the, the advice I've received from Ms. Grimsley and other board members, and I'll share that with you in a moment. But I want the people that are in the departments to speak this evening because they are the source that's going to tell you the accurate, true information as it is current today. <coughs> They are, in the, they are with those departments and they can speak to the accuracy of those numbers. Um, at the end of that, if you have any questions, I'm gonna let Ms. Grimsley handle that and we could have our board members question any of those department heads. Um, but, but again, those folks are here this evening to talk directly to some of those numbers. First person I've asked to speak this evening is Art Whitaker, who is our transportation director. Mr. Whitaker. Good evening. Uh, I'm here tonight to report to the Board of Education that transportation's biggest challenge continues to be bus driver shortages. We do continue to fight that on a daily basis. We're short bus drivers, we're short uh, monitors, we're short uh, van drivers. Uh, we have taken, uh, we're currently anywhere between 35 and 40 vacancies that we need to fill. So you have that 35 to 40 uh, vacancies that you need to fill. And then on top of that, we have our COVID people that are coming in and out of our COVID protocol. So it, that is a rolling number as well, as some of them come in, some of them go out. So as you can understand that uh, these people that are in our COVID protocol, basically some of them could be, basic, um, they could be our positive individual or it could be our close contact or they could be the, uh, the parent of a child that has actually been quarantined and they needed to stay home due to the fact of uh, uh, a close contact. So that is a rolling number, but basically the underlining uh, issue is that we are short 35 to 40 bus drivers. The COVID issue does nothing but complicate, uh, the, complicates our issue about trying to make sure that we have a bus driver in every seat. Um, if you also understand that the school bus uh, under federal mandate is a piece of mass uh, transit Therefore, we fall under the mask mandate as far as um, uh, the, that like form of transportation. So all of our bus drivers are wearing masks. You're on the bus, as CCS protocol says, you're on the bus, you wear a mask as well. Um, so in my opinion, uh, we are no better and we are no worse than any other district around. Uh, we all share the same 
uh, problems. We all share the same challenges. Um, I can tell you that some of us do a better job at it than others. Uh, if you were uh, basically looking at the news uh, over the weekend, I think uh, Guilford County has uh, gotten to the point where they can't transport their high schoolers. And uh, they're actually putting those high schoolers on city buses and they're only transporting a few. I want to rest assured, I want the board to be assured tonight that we are not anywhere close to that. We, are, uh, we have our challenges, but we, uh, we work through those challenges on a daily basis. So, um, you know, everybody, uh, everybody in my department drives a bus, everybody is on a monitor on a bus, and we're doing everything to make sure that those uh, vacancies are filled. So uh, it's not perfect, it's not gonna be perfect, but we're able, it's a manageable situation right now, and we're able to make sure that the kids are getting to and from school uh, in, a, in somewhat of a timely fashion. Uh, best way to describe this year, it's been, a, it's been a roller coaster. It's been a staffing roller coaster. Uh, I can tell you at one moment, uh, the, uh, it looks like we, we, have the, uh, we have the horizon in sight and the next minute we're down. And so this has been nothing but a roller coaster on our behalf, uh, but we somehow, uh, we work with a great uh, staff and a great uh, amount of people and we somehow figure it out each and every day. So that's, a, that's basically it in a nutshell from transportation. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Mm -hmm. Next, I've asked Stephanie Almond, our school nutrition director, to speak to her staffing problems and concerns. Good evening. So currently in SMP, we have 50 vacancies out of 270 total positions. That works out to be just shy of 19%. Um, we have about nine that are in the hiring process. We've turned in the paperwork and we're just they're working their way through. And we have another dozen that are on various types of leave, whichever kind. Um, this is actually a nationwide problem with school nutrition. Um, I took an informal poll from a few of our surrounding counties to see what their percentage was of vacancies. Charlotte Mecklenburg, excuse me, let me clarify that, in school nutrition, not overall. Charlotte Mecklenburg was 25%, Wake County 19%, Cleveland County, 35%, Mooresville graded, 18%. So we have um, basically the same overall as many of the other districts in the state and in the country. Now, our dedicated employees are doing a tremendous job uh, preparing, serving nutritious meals every day. They work some absolute miracles, as you all know. Um, we've learned to be flexible. We can change direction on a dime, uh, switching menus, changing the bag lunches if we need to, shuffling staff from one school to another. Um, sometimes we have to stop a la carte service, and it's not unusual to see one of our field supervisors or a principal or another administrator in there serving food or working in the um, working the cashier lines and we're grateful for everybody's teamwork on that. Now, our 50 vacancies are basically more than one per school on average that we are missing. We already try to keep our staffing very lean because that is the largest um, spending that we have to do anyway. And so we try to keep no more than is required or needed for what we're serving in the school. So. When you're already um, kind of lean and then you have uh, additional vacancies on top of it, it just gets very tricky. Now we have started distributing the SR2 bonuses that I told you all about last month. Um, we hope that those retention bonuses are going to inspire some folks to stay uh, that maybe were considering retirement or leaving. Uh, we have been advertising our hiring bonus that I told you about, and we have seen some interest. We've had about, I think, 18 calls since we put it out with a phone number, and we've been keeping track. Um, in fact, we've just recommended for hire one of those nine people is actually one of the first people that spotted our sign, our help wanted sign in the car rider line, and called, and so they have made it through the process um, to get through the interview and everything and go to HR. And we certainly hope that the financial provisions in the state budget will also serve as incentives because that is a common thing that we hear on our end. So ironically, 
The shortage of employees comes not only in the middle of a additional source of stress, which is our supply chain chaos, when we don't always know what's coming on the next truck or what might not be, um, but also, ironically, while we are experiencing really about the highest and historic numbers of students eating breakfast and lunch, which I think in the end is the most important thing. So that's all. Stephanie, thank you. Yes, sir. Next, we will have Chuck Taylor, our facilities director, report on his department. Mr. Taylor. Good evening, board members. Uh, what I'd like to report to you is, is basically the same as the other directors have told you. We have roughly 23 custodian positions vacant right now. Uh, that's roughly 10%. That's not too far off from what we normally are. We, you know, we usually have custodian positions open. Those are kind of a rolling thing. What I want you to know is I will stack this school system and the cleanliness of our schools against any county in this state. And I'll tell you why. We have the greatest folks out there in these positions and any school staff will tell you that the custodians are the backbones of these schools. Some of them have two, some of them have one, some of them have a half of one. These folks do a tremendous job. You can't pay them enough, you can't do enough for them. They'll never be paid or uh, compensated for what they are worth. What I'd also like to tell you, and I think the other directors were a great part of this, my custodial services manager, Andy Campbell, and I call him Mr. Miracle, and that's for a reason. He's uh, organized and worked with these other folks to do career fairs and hiring fairs that's paid off big dividends. And I hate to say it, but even some of the other departments have picked up some teacher assistants and things like that through these. So we've got very resourceful folks. They really come through and the pandemic is not going to beat these folks. They're not going to beat my folks. So this is really the story of Andy Campbell. I hope he's listening, because he is Mr. Miracle. <laughs> he has three roving custodians. They're busy every day. They fill in these spots. Yes, we have problems. We have issues. We need folks, but they make it happen every day. If you want to talk about people fighting on the lines of COVID, these are the people that come in and clean up after we have these uh, folks sent home. They're making sure your school's safe, and there is absolutely no evidence to support that our facilities are passing on or contributing to anybody contracting COVID. It's person-to-person -person contact only. Show me some evidence. I'll, I'm ready to argue with you. Anybody wants to fight over it, I'm good for it. There's two mottos that the maintenance team use, okay? I want all of you folks to remember this. The first one is one team, one fight. They all work together. They're all pulling together to make it happen every day. The second one is we'll either find a way or we'll make one. Resources are always short in school systems. I've been here eight years, I've never had enough, but we always make it happen. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Next, I would ask our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Dr. Bish. Good evening. Uh, so I'd like to share with you two areas. One is a vacancy report for certified staff. So what you see here is in a nutshell, right now we're showing 68 vacancies across the board, K-12, pre-K-12 in all areas however 18 of those are in process already we have hire sheets in we are working our way through background checks drug testing etc so basically we have a net of about 50 or right at 50. Um, principals continue to interview we continue to when we find 
applicants. We are trying to scour the system for them as we have time and send them applicants to interview. They are interviewing. So we are right at about 50 in terms of certified vacancies right now. So that's better than it was when I talked to you in November, not where we want to be by any stretch, but better than where we were. The second thing I want to share with you is what are we doing to try to look at working our way out, not just today, but down the road. Uh, if you'll recall, I have shared with you that we are in the process of doing virtual interviews with participate. Those are international teachers all over the world. Um, and we are actually doing early contracts. So we have offered and have had accepted 22 who have accepted contracts for the 22-23 school year. We have three more contracts that are in process with Participate, the company that we work with. Now, let me be clear, you're probably familiar with this for dual language, but we've gone beyond that. We are using Participate for math, for science, for all content areas. And so we aren't doing just dual language. That's one pot, but we're also doing others. So we currently have 25 commitments for next year. In addition, we currently are hosting 84 student teachers. Spring is the larger semester. You recall we only had about 20 in the fall. We hired 12 of them. Um, we are currently um, hosting 84 and we are actively recruiting the best of them. Principals are already talking to them. As they begin to move into February, they will start taking over the classes and we will begin to see them teaching in the rooms. And so we will work with them so that by the end of April, we will be able to offer contracts to them for the 22-23 school year. So we're looking at that as well. We have 10 recruitment trips scheduled and we have four more in process for this spring. Um, we have some of our administrators who are doing those trips, but I'll be honest, I'm sending Dr. Williams, the director, and Dr. Smith, the coordinator, along with Leslie Griffith, who is the new um, retention specialist in my department, and they are going with the intent that when we meet a candidate, they know where principals have said, I'm going to have this opening and they're going to get a principal on the phone and they're going to hand them to a candidate and we're going to see if we can early contract while they stand there so they don't go talk to somebody else at the next table like Charlotte. We also, <laughs> we also are posting um, jobs virtually across the country. So we're trying to look at how are some things that we've done differently such as early contracts and international teachers to get ahead of the game. Um, we, are, we are behind the eight ball right now. I'm not going to I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but we are getting there. A number of those 18 in process and a number of those hired this past month were EC. We're really proud that we are pushing forward on that. So that's where we are and where we're going with hiring. The question came up about substitutes for classroom teachers. So let me give you a little update on that. Since the school year started, we have completed 60 hires for substitutes. That's all the way through and they are on the active sub list. We have another six that will be invited to orientation this Wednesday. They are already on there for this Wednesday. Once they complete our orientation, they have a video training. They must do two video trainings. One is on law. These are things we used to do in person that we now allow them to do at their um, convenience online. We have 11 who are in the step of, of completing video training. We have four who are out for background checks. That's the next step. We have um, 21 that we are in the reference check step. And we are streamlining reference checks so that there is now a team in my office that does telephone reference checks. We find a lot of times what we're finding as we dig in is that um, we're waiting on um, written references. We don't want to wait. So we're just going to start doing phone references instead. And we have a team that will be doing that. In addition, then, we have 13 that are new applications that have come in that are in process of being filled out. And what the specialist in my office does is review them as sections complete to see if something's incomplete, we emailed the person immediately and say, go back and check this. It sometimes takes time for them to do that. And then we have four new applications that just came in. So all of that is what we're doing right now with subs. Now, I want to clarify a couple of things. First of all, 
we have a very large number of names on the substitute list. However, we purge that list every year and move to inactive anyone who has not subbed within the last year. So anyone on that list has subbed within the last year. Let me clarify what that means though. Lots and lots of our subs sub on one or two days that they have off from their regular job. So it's only a specific day or days. A lot of our subs do not sub on Friday or Monday. A lot of our subs are a substitute for one teacher. That's my friend. I agreed to be a substitute for her. I know her classroom. I'll sub for her, but nobody else. For a number of them, they sub only at one school. And so that pool is only for that school because I live there. I don't want to drive from Mount Pleasant to Cox Mill. That makes sense to me as well. In addition, we have uh, folks who were on the sub list who have told us, please don't take me off, but because of my age and the current pandemic, I'm not comfortable subbing right now. When it gets better, I'll be back. We don't want to remove them from our active list because I don't want to make it any harder for them to come back to working with us when they're ready. So when we say there's this huge sub list, there is. But each school doesn't have access to each of those people every single day. Subs decide when they'll work. And I will tell you, my first job in public education was as a substitute teacher. I picked and chose when it was convenient with me. And we have people that do that as well. We are facing the same issues as other districts. We had a personnel administrator meeting on Friday for our region. And this is a hot topic for all of us. They discussed the difficulty. Dr. Withers is going to share some data around our fill rate. And I will tell you that as she and I were looking at this, it is exactly within two or three percentage of everybody in our region. That doesn't make it okay. Please don't hear me say that. Our teachers are exhausted. Our teachers are bending over backwards. Our administrators are bending over backwards. We have parents who are in helping. We have subs every day in our district. We are in a tough time. But I will tell you as a principal, back in 2002, I had a coverage crew because in flu season, it wasn't unusual to not have a sub in one or two rooms and we had to cover. This is just a historical issue that has been exacerbated tremendously. It's not okay. We're gonna keep working at it. We're gonna keep pushing. We're gonna keep hiring. We're gonna move them through as fast as we can. We are going back and checking anyone who says, why wasn't I approved? We're, we're checking every single one but it's going to be difficult for a little while as people are still not comfortable being in school settings right now. But we are grateful to every single sub every single day that's in our schools, every single day. I have friends that sub in my grandchildren's schools because they live in the community. They don't go anywhere else, just there. So there's a lot of moving parts to this. We do struggle but we are making progress as we move along. So I wanted to give you an update on that and let you know that like many others, we're working together with our partners around the region and with, with our principals to make sure children have a strong, safe environment with an adult in front of them every day. Thank you, Dr. Bish. Dr. Withers is now going to give you a report, um, some information on our substitute uh, data, our pool, um, some of the situations that we're dealing with and, and what filled positions mean versus unfilled positions, et cetera. And I'll hand that over to Dr. Withers. Good evening, board. We're gonna talk through the data on teacher absences. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to share with you as we explored this information last week, we were taking a look at what our reporting systems currently were telling us. We do have two separate reporting systems. We have a financial um, reporting system as well as a human resource management system that helps us with subs. Um, and so we are working to make sure that we can streamline that and get a consistent report that gives us the data that we are looking for. So last week on Wednesday in our COVID update meeting with principals, our team's meeting on Wednesday the 5th, 
we discussed with principals and shared with principals the expectation that we need teacher absences to be consistently put in to what is called frontline, which is our human resource management system, to be sure that we have, again, a consistent data reporting system that each of us, including myself, can look at at a moment's notice and see what is the state in all of our schools. So we're working on making sure we get that process streamlined. Um, the principals have been doing a great job getting that in in the last week, at least by 12 p.m. the day before as we can obviously things happen between noon and the next morning uh, but we're taking a look at that multiple times during the evening and i thank hr for helping me pull that report each day so that we know that information next slide so here's the data this is what you're looking for um, by month we took a historical glance back um, again this is coming out of frontline and we're working on that process but if you look at each month there is a percentage here that is called the absence fill rate going forward you will hear us use that term so we want to be sure to use that tonight um, that means that a Cabarrus County sub is in that position so from our sub pool in September 2021 if we of our teacher absences that month 59.5 percent of our teacher absences were filled by a Cabarrus County sub um, which means that on the flip side of that 40.5 percent of our absences were covered by our own staff that could be a TA, that could be a teacher, that could be a principal. Um, I was in a school last week that a principal was covering a classroom. So um, that could be any range of our personnel, but 40.5% 40 40 in September were covered by internal staff. If you look at October, 60.6% .6 was the fill rate. Um, that means, again, the Cabarrus County sub pool was covering 60.6, .6, which means 39.4% was being covered by internal staff. November, 57.9% through our sub pool, 42.1 by staff. December, 55.8 by our sub pool, 44.2 by internal staff. January, of course, we're only pulling for one week there. Everything else is an entire month average. We only have one week worth of data there. 44.5 was filled by our sub pool and 55.5 by our staff. So as we look at these numbers and each day as we evaluate what the schools are looking like for the next day and making plans for that, we again started talking about future planning. Next slide, please. So a couple of things that we have already been in talks with last week and continue to have talks with and are adding to this future planning each and every day. Um, one, as I said, we, we will do continued professional development on absence reporting with our principals. Um, Frontline is a powerful tool that they can use, and so we're going to walk them through those reports and making sure that they understand the data that's at their fingertips, as well as the data that we can use to make decision, decisions each and every day. Um, we have worked through developing support teams for coverage. What that means is this is Ed Center personnel, people that are based here, that can go out and be deployed into the schools to help with coverage if we have a school that happens to be in crisis and needs additional support. Principals, again, last week were talk, we talked in that COVID update about how they can do that. So they are texting me in the evenings, telling me if there's um, an issue at their individual schools. They're texting other members of Cabinet, having conversations, and then Cabinet is collaboratively working to make sure that we can deploy the resources as needed to keep our buildings open for students. Um, future planning as well, and I think Dr. Kapicki will speak to this, we would um, like to explore compensation for teachers for intermittent class coverage when teachers exceed that five-day flex accrual that they already have. Dr. Kapicki and Ms. Herndon will be working on that, as well as exploring incentive bonuses for substitutes for work greater than daily assignments. So if a substitute is working more than one day a week, if they're committing to potentially every day in a month or every day over a time period, looking at what funding is available for incentive bonuses for those substitutes that are working to help us support. And Dr. Kapicki and Ms. Hernan are continuing to work on that as well. Questions? <coughs> so to that, before you begin your questions of any of the staff members that spoke this evening, I'd like to thank all of the people that were here this evening to speak and to commend them for the excellent work that you're doing in leading your departments. Again, you're an example of the excellence that, that, the excellence that exists here in the Cabarrus County school systems. And without question, the people that you are charged with leading are doing an exceptional job in keeping our schools open. Remember, our goal is to keep our doors open so our kids can come into school every day. We are committed, and I can tell you as your superintendent, 100% committed to keeping the doors open so our schools come in every day to be in front of our teachers so that they can learn in person. That is our goal 100% every single day. 
That is being accomplished because you have outstanding, dedicated individuals in the system and fabulous teachers that are doing a yeoman's job every single day, going above and beyond um, what the, the normal call of duty is for a teacher. So in saying that, in some of my conversation with Mrs. Grimsley, one of the things that she has suggested to me, as other board members have, is John, how can we compensate our teachers and what are some of the creative ways that we can come up with to pay some of our teachers um, for the duties that they're doing? So in some of my conversations today, I don't wanna put words in people's mouth, I'm gonna be general instead of specific, but in talking with our new Chief Financial Officer, Carol Herndon, um, and running by some of these scenarios, we believe that we can create a financial uh, system where we can reward our teachers and pay them for the coverage that they're doing in our high schools or our middle schools or in our elementary schools, when they're being pulled from prep periods and other duties, that we can pay them a, a financial, um, I don't want to call it a reward, that's not, that's not accurate, but we can give them compensation for the extra work that they're doing. Um, what I need, what I'm asking the board is, is to support that and allow us to, to uh, pursue that further so we can come up with a, a plan to get that system in place um, sooner rather than later. I, I, would, I do not want to wait until February 7th to do that at the next board meeting. I'm asking the board sometime this evening before the, the, the meeting closes to give us as an administration permission um, to create a compensation system where me working with our cabinet and working specifically with our new chief financial officer um, to create a system where we can compensate our teachers for covering classes. Also, we want to talk about incentivizing. We've seen this throughout the country and other, other areas as well where we can incentivize some of our substitutes and reward them that if through longevity, whether it be two weeks, three weeks, or a month, that we can offer bonuses to keep them coming back to the Cabarrus County school system and showing them through our compensation model that we value the work that they're doing. Um, so there's some of the things that we want to want to ask the board for, I know I'm being a little general because we're working through some of the details now, but we do believe we can create a compensation system where we can reward our teachers and pay them for the coverage that they're giving on a daily basis. The other thing I wanna point out, and I wanna make this real clear, um, Dr. Woods did a fantastic job of kind of breaking down some of the day-to-day the -day functions of what we do, and, and I'm sure you have questions, but I wanna make this really clear. Our teachers are showing up for work every single day and they're coming in and doing a fantastic job. Our absence rate is, is some days are, it's higher than others as I think uh, Mr. Whitaker said it very well this evening. It's a roller coaster, you know, depends. They're taxed, they're overwhelmed. They also have families, they have children, they have significant people in their lives they have to take care of and they're doing a fantastic job. It's still coming in every day. Our attendance rate in the district of Cabarrus County, right now we're at 94% throughout the year. That's from September 1st to today, um, our attendance rate for our teachers is 94%. So what does that mean? That means that on any given day, um, the average is 6% of our teachers are not here because they are sick, because they have personal time, because they have doctor's appointments, because they have to take care of family, they have to take care of kids for many reasons, a myriad of reasons. But on average, that means that Roughly speaking, we have about 123 staff members on average, and I'm only speaking to teachers that have students in the classroom. We have roughly on average 123 teachers that are out on a, da on a daily basis on average across the Cabarrus County's 43 schools. And about 50% of that is being covered, and I'm being general here, but I know I'm close, about 50% of that is being covered through our sub pool, and the other 50% is being covered by our teachers within the system. And they're the folks we wanna compensate, that's what I'm asking the board this evening. Let give us the opportunity to create that system to compensate them sooner rather than later. Again, some days are higher and some days are lower, but on average, it's not, it's not something that we, we, we're not managing. Is it stressful? Is it difficult? Is there a lot of pressure on our students? Is there a lot of pressure on our, on our teachers? Absolutely. Um, and again, it's because of their dedication, it's because of their service, their commitment to our school system that we're continuing to keep the doors open and keep our kids in, in school on a daily basis. So I, I, again, I keep saying I commend them, but I can't say it enough. And I know the board feels this way because I've talked to individual board members. I know you have asked me many times, what can we do? And I know that you're committed to helping them and I know that you value them because you tell me that in every, every conversation we have. So I thank the board 
for working with me and for continuing to ask me and challenge me what are the ways that we can come up with to help our teachers and these are some of th th these are some of the things that that we're sharing with you tonight some of the real data that we're dealing with this is the actual facts the actual evidence that we can point to as to what's going on in our system and again i'm going to close by saying i'm asking you uh, through my conversation with mrs <coughs> grimsley and others you have asked me and you have also encouraged me to find ways um, to compensate them and you have you said that you would support that i'm asking you to give myself and our chief financial officer the ability to create that compensation system and come back to you in February with that system, but I'd like to put it in play prior to. Finally, I wanna say this, um, ESSER funding has been a big question. What are we doing with the ESSER funding? I can tell you February 7th, um, Carol Herndon, our chief financial officer, is gonna give the board a comprehensive overview of the ESSER funding um, status as to where we are, what we're doing with that, that funding. So she will explain to you what we've done with the funding thus far and what our plans are moving forward. But in fairness to her and to her department, she has been here two weeks. So it's gonna take her a little bit of time to get her feet on the ground. I can tell you already in the two weeks she's been here, she's educated myself and others um, to many different things that, that with the, with the, uh, the financial situation of the district. Um, you, have a, you have an excellent chief financial officer there that's going to um, <coughs> fill you in on the, the details of the ESSER funding and um, she'll do that very well, I have no doubt. To give you an update though, in a very general picture so that you understand what we've received so far. The first round of ESSER funding, which is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security, often referred to as the CARES Act, Cabarrus County Schools received $3,469,198. In the second round of ESSER funding, which is referred to as the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, Cabarrus County Schools has received $13,312,386. And in the third round, the American Rescue Plan Act, Cabarrus County Schools has received $29,770,928. So the total for those three fundings, sources, those federal monies that have been allocated over a three year period is $46,552,512. So that's the general big picture overview of how much money we've received that we're gonna be allocating over the next three years. <coughs> and Mrs. Hearn is going to explain that to the board on February 7th, giving you a more detailed look at where the funding has gone so far and then what our long-term plans are for the funding in the future. Uh, so if you have any questions on that, I would ask you to just reserve those for February 7th to give Mrs. Hearn a chance to wrap her arms around all that information and be able to adequately and appropriately uh, inform the board of, of that situation. I'm gonna stop there and I would ask the board and hand it over back over to Mrs. Grimsley. And if there are any questions, please feel free to ask any of the folks that are here this evening. Again, to all of you, I thank you. And uh, I, I, I stand correct that I would like to ask our assistant superintendent for auxiliary services, John LeGrand, if there was anything that we missed this evening, sir, and if anything you would like to offer. And when John is done, I would ask again, I'd hand it back over to Mrs. Grimsley. If there are any questions, please ask. And again, thank you folks. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kapicki, and good evening, board members. Uh, I just wanted to point out, you heard about the difficulty in staffing that we've had with many of our other departments. Our Kids Plus program is also suffering. We're at a, a critical point. And in speaking with other counties, um, in, in all of these departments, it's pretty much across the board. Um, they're facing the same unprecedented challenges that, that we are with staffing and with the staff that we do have uh, going out in quarantine and that type of thing. Um, so it is a, a difficult situation. We'll continue to find new creative methods, job fairs, applying for grants, for bonuses, the same things that we've been doing, trying to, to, to figure out how we can attract uh, more employees in to, to make the daily operations go smooth here in our, in our district. And I just want to, while I'm, I'm here on record, uh, express my s sincere appreciation for the employees that we do have that are working miracles every day. Um, I mean, SMP, Transportations, Kids Plus, the custodial staff, Miracle Man, Andy Campbell, um, you know, all of those people, and Chuck's a Miracle Man too, don't let him, don't let him fool you. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to work with some, some very strong leaders and our directors and i just want to uh thank them for all their hard work they don't hear that a whole lot um it's especially not publicly so and last thing i want to say is anybody that's interested um, in joining our team this is an awesome team um, please call us 
Look it up on the website, apply. We'd love to have high quality folks in our district. So thank you. Thank you, John. And we are gonna have actually Dr. Kapiki back to the podium. There is a slide uh, that's gonna be shown uh, regarding uh, absenteeisms that probably breaks this down just a little bit better. So just give us a few minutes. While we are doing that, I'll go ahead and do some action items. I would, we'll open it up for the board for discussion, but I would like to ask for a motion to amend the agenda and add 13.03 for teacher coverage compensation at the end of the action agenda. I so second moved. that. I'll take a movement by Ms. Sandage and a second by Ms. Blackwell. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? That motion passes unanimously. So we will add 13.03 under the action agenda and it will be titled teacher coverage compensation. And I will remind you that 13.02 will be the calendar revisions that we discussed as well. So give us just a few minutes. They're going to load that slide so that we can see that breakdown just a little bit easier. <coughs> Um, I'm not sure if they're quite ready, but I was going to actually just start down the line. Okay. I, I would prefer for you to see that, and that would conclude their presentation. That was just a slide that was left, so just let's give them just a moment. And I'll just make the comment while you're getting ready. When we were talking about what does <coughs> has our year looked like regarding absences, um, substitutes, uh, teacher coverage, people wanted to know was last week worse? Um, you know, what, was there a critical day? Uh, you know, that opened up a lot of questions. You know, from the board, from the community. So they actually did this report today that shows us all the way back from the beginning of the school year. That report will be. Um, expanded for our next uh, planning session that will show what we've done pre-COVID. So that will give us a lot of good information. But for right now, it's just gonna take it all the way back to the beginning of the school year and kind of bring us forward. And uh, that'll give us a, a really good snapshot. Dr. Kapiki, do we need to take a recess for just a few minutes? Are you good? Okay. Are you ready? Yep. Will you key your mic up down there? I think it actually. Sure, we're on. good. So what you hear, see here, if Mr. Hughes can scroll down slowly when I ask him to and just hold there for a moment, you'll see September 1st. You'll see that the, the far right column is the attendance rate that we have for that day. So we had 95.8% of our teachers that were in classrooms with students in front of them in session that day. So that particular day, our absence rate was 4.2 or 86 absences. Again. This is not an entire district snapshot. This doesn't include your folks that are not in front of kids. This is just teachers that are in classrooms in front of students, okay? Um, and you look down, you see, you see the percentages, 95.8, 95.3, 93.1, et cetera. The middle column is ob obviously the, per the absence rate for the day, and then the, 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 the first column is how many people are out that particular day. A snapshot, not the entire district. Again, that is just teachers that are in front of kids 
in the a classroom. Full, a full day or, class, or per class? Full, this is full day, full, day this is full day only. We do have another spreadsheet, Mr. Walter, good point, on um, hourlies, if you had two hours off or an hour off. But we didn't feel as though that was as significant as showing the, the full day because that's the, that's the one that is what we key in on first to make sure we have people covering those classes with our sub pool and with our teachers during their prep time, okay? So if you scroll down again, Mr. Walter, or excuse me, uh, Mr. Hughes. If you'll stop there for a moment, you can get a, get a grasp of the idea that fairly consistent for the first couple months. You have a couple days that are blips on the screen and there are various reasons. It may be tied around a holiday where um, folks took a, a day off before or a day after and it caused us a problem, but consistently speaking, you can see we're around that 94% rate. If you continue to scroll down, please. And hold there. Again, you see consistent attendance rates. You, you see consistent patterns throughout the school year. Scroll down again, please. And again, you can see where we are currently right now. And on the return back, you, you, you one could see that it's slightly lower than the average of 93 to 94%. But again, it's a four day window and it's returning back from the holiday when we did expect it to be um, a little lower than, than, than the average. So again, when you look at that, you're seeing consistency across the board throughout the school year in terms of our attendance. And what, what I, when I look at that, I say to myself, our teachers are fantastic. They're coming in every single day, they're doing a great job, they're showing up under the most trying circumstances that they possibly could be, and yet they, they're coming in every single day working. Does it mean that they're challenged and they're stressed and that we have shortages and that we have challenges in filling classes and that our teachers are doing the, the, the biggest lift in filling those classes? Absolutely. But again, you have to look at it from a positive end. The, the teachers in the Cabarrus County School System are stepping up to the plate and doing a fantastic job, which is why, again, I'll close with by saying to you, I'm asking you to allow us to develop a compensation system to reward them so that we can pay them for their coverages that they're doing. And I have full faith in our new CFO that we can collectively sit together and figure out what that looks like. So while you were getting ready, we actually already added that and made the amendment to the agenda to add it. We'll do that at the end of the action agenda. So with that, I'm going to open the floor up. I will begin with Ms. Adcock, questions or comments? I really don't have any questions. I just want to say um, that just by hearing what I heard everybody come up to the podium and speak, you know, none of us asked for COVID. It just came without our permission and pretty much just turned our world upside <coughs> down all over. And I just, um, as I heard people speak, I just want to say I'm so proud to serve along such a great, excellent school system and its team, teamwork. That's what I heard over and over again. Together, everyone achieves more. So I just want to thank everybody for their excellent teamwork during this time. Yes, I, okay. Uh, well, well, we've talked about a couple, many things. Uh, but first of all, um, taking each department. Um, now, for instance, the bus uh, transportation of the, they said they needed 30 to 40 drivers. How many uh, at right now, because I know it's like this, how many uh, uh, people did they have in quarantine right now? How many people do you have in quarantine? I have about 15. 15 in quarantine right now. Okay. Uh, they, and you said you've got 30 and 30 and 40, that's just drivers, that's not mechanics, that's not, if that's you correct. had to say, how many people do I need for everything? How many people would you need, not just drivers, but for your whole transportation department? How many vacancies do you have? I, I am fully staffed in mechanical uh, side of it, so I don't need any mechanics. We are blessed at this point in time that we're fully staffed mechanical wise. Uh, I do need 35 to 40 uh, drivers to come in each and every day. Uh, that would uh, that would put us back up to being fully staffed. So with everything, that's that would your be, that, yes, everything. Yes, because I know you've got yes, some other. Little yeah, things, we have but, we have some so other departments, just, but to be a fully operational department, I would need anywhere between 35 and 40 people. Okay, all right, that's your questions. Okay, new uh, nutri nutrition. You're next. Uh, okay, with yours. Um, 
the only thing I had with you two quarantines. What do you have on quarantines? I have I have eight student. I mean, excuse me. I have eight employees right now on um, quarantines. Okay. The other thing I wanted, and I'm letting you give a little commercial, please, uh, because you mentioned your bonuses. Yes. Real quick, to, to tell, I'm letting you give a commercial. $500, if you would tell yes. real thank, quickly thank about you. what you're offering. $500 all to uh, new hires, uh, as many as 50 of them, uh, off after their 90th day. And didn't you have something else for new hires? And new That's the, for the new hires. And then we also have a retention bonus for any employee once they are, uh, well, after they've been employed for 90 days. But that's the ones that have been working for us this, um, all along. And that's $500 as well. And, and what was there something if you if you referred somebody or something? Was that, that was one of the ideas we had thought about oh, but and we just didn't kind of do tossed around. One. But the new hire, that was the main, I mean, the yes. new one is what I wanted you to do. Yes, okay, uh, that was my only question for, for you, I think, uh, with that one. And custodial, uh, I know you've got your magic man, uh, but do you have many quarantines at all also? So ma'am, because I don't directly hire and supervise each custodial staff, I don't have the quarantine numbers. I know how many vacancies we have out there. Okay. So I don't want to give you a bad number, but if you would like, I can get that number. For okay. You. Well, that that's good. Well, you but your your vacancies, your total vacancies. Twenty three out of one hundred and ninety two. One hundred ninety two. Okay. One ninety two, and you've only got twenty three. Yes, ma'am, and roughly that's ten percent. <coughs> Even in times of uh, before the pandemic, we were somewhere close to that within five to six percent. Okay. So that's normal out of a, a workforce of 192 people okay. because of the type position and the hours. Good job. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And again, all you that presented, thank you. You all did an excellent job, and we really appreciate it. Now, one of the things we talked about subs, and whoever wants to give me this answer is fine, because we've talked a lot about substitutes. What, and we always talk about, uh, you had talked to begin with about our teachers being getting national certification. What does it take to, to do being a subs? Do you have to have a national certification or what does it basically take? Mary, you probably can, what would somebody have to do to be a substitute? Because we're it talking takes a, about. It takes a high school diploma. That's okay. it. Um, the high school diploma and then they, we run a background check and we do um, telephone references for your most recent supervisor if you have one. Um, if they don't have high school transcripts, that's okay. A picture of their high school diploma is enough. Um, and we do the background check, we do a drug test, and we onboard them, and then we have them do two virtual trainings on the law and on effective teacher training. Those have been required since I came into Cabarrus County in 1989. Um, those are basics, that's it. They do not have to have a college degree, a two-year degree. If someone has those degrees and wishes to give us their transcripts to verify that, that increases their daily pay rate. But the requirement is a high school diploma, passing the background check, same as everything else, passing the drug test, and two um, references. Okay, because I, I didn't know, I years ago I took that training to become a, I, I mean years ago I took it before I become a board member, but I didn't know if that had changed. But well, the, uh, the content of the training has changed, but the effective teacher training teaches people who have never worked with children how to de-escalate, how to read lesson plans, how to follow the protocols, and then, of course, we have our legal briefing so that they understand what the laws around working in public schools entail. And, and they can do that on their own. They are virtual. They can stop and start it, but they do those two. And when they're completed, we have onboarded, we have gone through all the process, and we're ready to put them out on the sub list. So high school diploma is all that's required. A viewing audience, please hear that. Uh, we need subs. So that was, that was something I, I, I was hoping people would hear because, again, that is something that uh, 
people that are mm -hmm. wanting to do something because we can always take good subs. Okay, uh, and again, how many did we say we would like to, you know, if you had your, how many would you like to add to your sub list? Anybody that wants. Okay. Uh, there is there is no top limit because again, people sub in the areas where they live or they may sub only, I only want to work with elementary or I only want to do high school math because I'm a retired accountant. Um, so we don't have a top number. We continue to take subs. We have never shut off hiring subs. Okay. So we don't have a number that we're looking at for subs. Okay. That's, that's good to know. All right. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Ms. Blackwell. So again, um, I just want to say uh, thank you for all of the hard work and presenting all of this information. Um, I think that we see how important it is um, to make sure that we are providing accurate information to the public, to parents. Um, clearly, we are doing above and beyond um, what, what we have this entire time, again, as Ms. Um, Adcock stated, you know, COVID was, was thrown at us. And so we have really seen during this time what we're made of. And you guys are made of, I don't even, I don't even know what the word is, but y'all are doing a fantastic job. Um, I appreciate you pulling all of this information together to make sure that we have all of this accurate and correct information. Um, so thank you. Thank you again for all of your hard work, and and uh, we we truly truly appreciate all of you. Thank you, Mr. Fur. Well, I got kind of mixed emotions about this. First of all, uh, thank you very much for taking the. You could tell it took a lot of time to put this together. I just, I mean, I'm not happy with the circumstance that uh, we had. To, you guys had to go through this exercise just to because of some information that was not true that got to the community and that's, and that's wrong. But, uh, you know, back about a year ago, maybe about, about this time, we talked about what it was going to take to keep our kids in school. And we knew that it was going to take sacrifices and it was going to take a lot of hard work by some, by a lot of people. And that's what y'all have done. And I'm for one thankful so thankful that we're able to send these kids to school. And I think we need to probably take Chuck's motto, one team, one fight, and make that the Cabarrus County's new motto. So thank, thank all of you. Like I said, I, it's amazing what y'all have done. Mr. Walter. Um, I'll agree that that's some of the most detailed information that we've had on a snapshot on where we stand. So I appreciate all the work that went into gathering that and providing that with us tonight. Um, I had a question for Chuck. If you're still, are you still here, you're still here. So those folks, you, our custodians, are working hard. And we have 23 vacancies. Do we use any outside contractors to come in and help relieve some of the stress of the of the of the folks? Thank you. Like cleaning up afterwards if somebody's got a COVID or something. No, sir. But I do have a utility tech crew that we bring in when we need extra help at schools for extra uh, disinfection and sanitizing. Okay, but would that be eligible for ESSER funds to have contractor if we needed, if that, if we needed that? I, I would say yes to that initially, but I would check with uh, our finance department first, but I would say yes to that. And secondly, uh, Mr. Taylor is gonna give the board an update on how we clean schools and sanitize them too this evening. So you're gonna get that report as well this evening. Okay, sorry to jump the gun. Then. So, um, and then my other question was for Art, if you're still here. Thank you. Thank you. So you mentioned that we've got the vac we've got the vacancies and we have people that are certified bus drivers and they're driving if they need it to. Yes, sir. Are uh, we doubling up on buses? What, what is the longest trip now? Are we? Well, how you is know, that looking? Our saving grace is the fact that we are actually double running uh, when we're so short. Uh, the the saving grace is that we're actually able to double run school buses, and that's a that's a that's a strain on the schools. We we take uh, some of the kids and we put them in the cafeteria or in the auditorium, and uh, we take a group home, and then that same bus driver comes back and gets that other group and takes that other group home. So that's actually how we're able to accomplish being uh, 
uh, being down 35 to 40 drivers, that's actually how we're able to get the kids to and from so school. What's so what's the wait? And typically, how long would the bus be now? Now, how long is it? Uh, that could over? probably add anywhere between 15 to 20 to 30 minutes on a route. So it just, uh, it just, we're going to go. Uh, it may be more information than 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 you really need, but we're going to go and we're going to take a group of students home that's closest to the school. So we're going to take that group home, and the and the kids that are the furthest away will come back and get those and bring them back. So it's a it's a constant shuttle back and forth from. Uh, it's not from ideal, but obviously you're. It's, it's not ideal, and uh, believe me, uh, we wouldn't do it if we didn't have to. But uh, these are unprecedented times, so the word uh, double route seems to be a very uh, common phrase around transportation. All right, thank you very much. That's all I had at the moment. All right, just so you won't have to walk back up again. I'm not <laughs> sure if Ms. Sanders will cover, but you keep talking about how many were short. But what, what is full staff for bus drivers? What is your full maximum? We We would uh, be able to run about 300, 310 school buses. So we're down around 260, 265. So uh, I would like to add, if I put the 40 back on, that would bring us right back up to 305, 310. So, so 305 uh, to 310 is what yep, you're. That would be that achieving. would be fully staffed. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So you're down that 40 to 50. Yep. We did that number just needed to be put out there just so we know exactly yep. what that looks like. F to be fully staffed would yes. be over 300 school buses. Okay, great. Okay. All right, thank you, Miss mm -hmm. Sandage. Sure. Thank you for these presentations. This information is a lot for us and we absolutely should have this our public should absolutely know that we have problems and what those problems look like so that when they want to help us they can help us lots of questions so the absences when those occur what are teachers or what are staff in the building doing so for example if i get a email that says my kid is in math class but they're supposed to be in an agricultural class during this time what has happened in situations like that so um, what i'm asking is do we have kids that are in classes that are not their specific class so in a subject that is not their specific subject at that time because we have that teacher absent Ms. Sanders, I'm sure there are situations, I could not be specific, but I'm sure there are situations where our principals have to be flexible and adapt to whatever's happening at that moment in time in the building. So what you're suggesting, I would not say could not happen. I just couldn't verify it 100%. Okay. And then when I hear um, reference to kids being placed in like a gym setting mm -hmm. because there aren't enough teachers um, in the building, can you tell me what has happened there as well or, or if that's even true? Yes, I think it's accurate to say that there are occasions when our principals and our, our stressed so much with staffing concerns where we may be short um, across 43 buildings where we do have to um, place students for a period or so in, in either the auditorium or the gymnasium and, and, and adapt as best we can at that moment in time. That's probably accurate. Okay. And if the folks who have presented tonight can walk me through the application process. So, for example, we say we have these applications in process. What does that look like? How long does that take? And um, you know, how easy is that, if, if you will? I'm gonna let Dr. Bish answer that. Thank you. So let's start with um, um, a certified person. Let's say we're hiring a teacher. So the teacher does an application uh, or implies for a job or puts in a general application. Let's suppose I have an elementary degree and I put in an application to teach elementary school. They may put in for any school or they may be specific. The principal then goes through those applications and calls those they wished for an interview. They do the interview. Once they do the interviews and have selected their candidate, they usually do some background checks as well. They will check the background check, I mean not background check, they will check the references that are in the system, in the online system. They then complete the, the um, document that says, it's, I want to hire this person. That comes into our department and the very first thing that happens is we start a background check. That background check, while we're waiting on it, the licensure specialist is checking their license. They are making sure that they either, A, hold a license in North Carolina for the area in which they're being hired, or 
they are checking to make sure they can be licensed. Sometimes they come from out of state and we check to see do we have reciprocity. Sometimes this is a person who would, we used to call it lateral entry, they are residential, that's the term you'll hear now, that they don't have a teaching license but they have a four-year degree in a similar subject and therefore they can teach while they're getting their teaching license. So all of that's going on while we do the background check. The background check can take all over the map. If they've only lived in North Carolina, probably less than a week, three or four days. If they've lived in multiple states, it can take several weeks. That's out of our control, particularly right now. Once all of that clears, we call the person for onboarding. We also call them for drug testing. We send them for drug testing. Wolf Data can do that in one day. It's usually back to us by the end of the day or the beginning of the day, the next day. At that point, we give them a start date. Now, we send all of that up to payroll. We take care of all of that. So those are the major steps that we're going through. We're checking their licensure, which means that we have to have transcripts. We, for a licensed teacher, we have to see your transcripts because we have minimal, minimal GPAs that we require. We won't give we won't hire a lateral entry with 1.0 GPA so we have to have certain documents but we start the background check then do the rest of it does that kind of walk you through the general process yeah so there's no given time frame for when an application for a certified teacher would be approved do I hear that correctly or there is a time frame maybe 30 we, days 45. okay our well it depends on I will tell you the biggest holdup is the background check <laughs> And so it can take anywhere from a week to a month based on how many states they've lived in or if it's someone that has been out of the U.S. If they have lived and worked out of the U.S., then that is another holdup. But for the most part, we are putting in processes now, and I would say this is, please understand, this is a beginning where we, have, we are setting expectations for what should happen within 24 hours what should happen within 48 hours. In general, when we get a specialist gets a hiring sheet from a principal, they move and, and begin the processing of it within 24 hours. How long it takes depends upon did the applicant upload official transcripts? Do we have to reach out and have you get them? Did the applicant get us names that we can call for references? Are we calling to get that information? Depends on the completeness of the application. If it's a good solid complete and they've lived in North Carolina, we can turn that around in about 10 days and have you in the classroom. But remember, sometimes they have to work a notice in another school district. Or if they're working somewhere else, a two week notice. So all of those things come into play, but we will act on it immediately. Uh, you are aware that when I came in in September, we were down six people in my office. As of uh, January 24th, we are fully staffed in human resources, 100%. So we're getting our processes back in place and, and reorganizing and streamlining to get that done. Now on a substitute side, it's really pretty similar the substitute will put in an application to be a sub. We will immediately, we check to be sure we have all the documents and we start the background check. Then the problem is that quite often folks who do the sub ones don't understand that they have to fill out each part. And so we have to reach out and make phone, and we try to make phone calls. We'll email, but if we don't hear back, we wanna make phone calls. So, but that's in amongst a lot of other positions custodians, cafeteria workers, all this. So that holds up things. But again, we do the background check, but then we have the piece of the virtual onboarding and them having to complete the two trainings. That's done at their pace. When they complete those two trainings, we're ready to onboard them through drug testing and start them. So there are lots of factors that can change how many days it takes. A lot of them depending on how complete is the application and how long does it take for us to help you get it complete. A lot of it dependent on where have you lived, how many states, and how long does it take us to get a background check back. Those are the two biggest ones we have. And that's for every single position? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so there's no specific timeline, if you will, because we're waiting on other people to do stuff. Right. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, we have a, we have a, 
wish timeline and we have an our timeline of expectation that once everything's there this is my expe expectation for moving it to the next step but then if there's something that we're having to wait on a background check or wait on you to get me transcripts or wait on a college transcript i'm held hostage there and we mm -hmm. keep reaching out to try to get that mm -hmm. so when i hear teachers say that there are no substitutes to pull from when they look at the list and there's a bunch of names on the list, but when they call those names, they aren't available. Some of them aren't subbing anymore. How do they identify the information that you specified earlier that says either I'm only going to work at this school, I'm not working right now because of this, so that it el eliminates the time of having to call all of these individuals, and then it doesn't appear that there is this big list of names that we can't pull from mm -hmm. so i think to that question that's one of the problems that we've discovered recently and using the frontline system i don't want to speak for dr Withers, but i'm looking over my shoulder to get confirmation that is one of the things that we're going to try and do an update in the frontline system so the teachers have an accurate list they're pulling from to know who's available what schools they want to teach at who's not available so it won't be a guessing game am i correct in that dr withers so that's us updating our frontline system and, and just becoming more aware that that's the system we should be using as our, our data collection source. Okay. So I have, let's see, I'm out for whatever day. I'm out Tuesday. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm out Tuesday. And on Tuesday, I, pick, I go through the substitute list and I try to find somebody. I can't find anybody, but I've, I've got to be out. What, can, what happens at, at that point? So first, teachers don't, always, teachers don't have to find their own subs. So if they are using the frontline system and they put it in, they don't have to be calling subs. Sometimes teachers do because they have their favorite subs. They have their subs they want or the subs they like and they start calling. So this is where Dr. Withers and I are working uh, on this. But if we use the frontline system properly, and as I used it as a principal, the system begins to try to call subs. And so some of our, our subs don't take the 5 a.m. calls, but others do. If, the, if I know I'm going to be out next week and I put it in, our substitutes will go through and say, oh, that's a school I work at. I will pick it up. And they simply put in, I'm taking that day. So it's very automated when we have enough notice. Now, in today's environment where teachers get sick their children get sick we have quarantines things are at the last minute so it may not get picked up by a sub who's out there because so many of them have said i'm not comfortable subbing yet but please don't take me off the list because i want to come back later in that case what happens at least i would say from my experience but every school is different let me emphasize that is that my treasurer, who came in usually at six in the morning, would look and see who's filled, who's not. So when I walked in the door at seven, the first thing as I walked by her door was she would hand me a list and say, here's who's out, here are the subs that are in these rooms, here's the two rooms we don't have filled and we'll have to do coverage on. She will have then been on the phone that morning calling to see some of our regular subs to say, can you work today? So it's, it's a process of if, depending on how people use the system, the system will first try to fill the sub. Then the treasurer will usually try to fill it. And at that point, then the third step is we would look for coverage. But we did this back in early 2000s. Um, this was not, certainly not at the level it is now. But that's the process I used. Now I can't speak for 43 principals but we are working on trying to help our principals understand how to use that frontline system to be able to do this so that it becomes a little more automated. But if I'm out and I only have my favorite sub and I call and that sub says I can't come tomorrow, now I'm stuck looking for someone else and I didn't, I didn't leave it open for someone to pick up. So there's lots of moving parts to this. Yes, but teachers are struggling to find subs. I want you to know that. Yes, because we have a long list. 
but that doesn't mean they're all available today. And I think this is the last question I had. Uh, can you just confirm, I heard that the approximate number of staff that we have out on any given day is 123? The numbers I gave you this evening were averages based on teachers that are in front of students in classrooms only. That does not count your guidance counselors, your school psychologists, social workers, people that aren't in the classrooms. On average, since September 1st, we've averaged about 123 teacher absences, okay, or 6% of the, of the, the staff on any, on any given day. Um, roughly half of those are covered through our sub pool, and the other half is being covered by our teachers um, through coverages. I want to be clear too, the frontline system is a system that we're trying to make more efficient, more effective, so we're consistent in what we do. But I don't want to mislead anybody. We do not have enough substitutes in the Cabarrus County school system. Um, we, do, we flat out don't, and that's why we're constantly trying to recruit more. But again, we're not unique to any other county in North Carolina or any school district in the United States. This is a problem that's across our country not just in schools, but I, I think that we were all aware of some of that. We could all tell stories of seeking employees to come and work for various, not only just school system, but various businesses as well. So it's not unique to just us. Um, but we do not have enough substitutes, which is why we're constantly trying to recruit more to come and help us, because the more substitutes we have, the more we can lean on our substitutes coming in to fill absences, the less we have to depend on our teachers to cover those classes. Just for clarity purposes, and then this might be Dr. Bish, um, you said frontline, we're just starting to use that properly. Are we, have we not been using that properly? Like what's, what are, what are we saying? So what are I would say to you is this. Using this? Yeah, or, I, okay. I think what we had was we had people doing good work and had some, some systems in place to get substitutes in the building. And Dr. Bish kind of alluded to some of those things. You might have a favorite sub you call, there might be a designated person that would reach out that maybe a select group of substitutes would only want to work in one building so we knew who they were they were a regular pool to draw from but it created some inconsistencies across the system so um, many of our schools are using the frontline system there's another system i don't want to go way down a, a path here because it would take all night for me to explain this to you but there's a timekeeper system that exists in the district that is supposed to be used just for us for payroll purposes and finance purposes and that system is also in some fashion was being used for, for monitoring substitutes. So there was some inconsistencies as to how we were, what system we were using more consistently to, to make sure that we had substitutes in, in the building, right? Um, so what, we, what we've decided that the best way to do this is use a frontline system because that's what the system is built for is to, it's one of the things that it's built for is to, um, be able to draw your substitutes from that particular system. So if we're consistent using just that system, I think it will be more effective and more efficient in making sure that more substitutes are in buildings covering classes. Again, I want to be clear, we do not have enough subs. It doesn't matter what system we use, we don't have enough substitutes. Whether it be frontline, time, timekeeper, people call, but we don't have enough bodies. And we have to continually find ways that are creative to to fill these classrooms so that we can take off some of the pressure and stress of our teachers covering those classrooms when we run out of subs. Yeah, that's perfect. I think it's great that we're going to be able to look into compensating our staff. Are we talking about just teachers or TAs or what are, what are certified, non-certified? Are we clarifying that later mm -hmm. maybe? I think what we're looking at right now is we want to be able to compensate those individuals that are covering classes in the building on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you're a teacher and you walk in and let's say you're a math teacher and you have, you're in, you're in a four by four, there's, there's four classes they teach and they're teaching three of their classes scheduled. And then during the prep, they're being told they have to cover or asked to cover a different class because there's no sub. We want to compensate that teacher for that particular time during the prep period. And that's what we're looking at right now. So initially what I'm talking about is compensating our teachers for covering those classes during their prep times. There was a reference to a survey. Was that already looked at that you were referring to, Holly? We will discuss that for sure. Okay. okay. I'm going to call time on that part of the discussion. Um, so we will discuss the teacher compensation because we've added that for yep. that part of the action agenda. So before we move forward, um, yes, we probably need to discuss that. So what thank you i know this took a lot of time and effort today that was definitely not dedicated to our agenda session for tonight so um, i'm sorry go ahead that's okay 
So, you know, what, what I want to say is it is extremely important. Board members are, have privileged information that comes down from the superintendent. And it's not that it's not information that won't be shared with the general public, shouldn't be shared with the general public. It's things that we all have to take a look at before we share it with the general public so that the information is vetted, it's corrected, it's reported, it's, it's uh, blessed by your administration, and then you bring it to the board so that we can look at it and decide what the board as a whole needs to take action on. It's disheartening when a board member chooses to disclose that information and the, and the, the information has parts and pieces that are inaccurate that stirs a lot of individuals in the community and starts set, setting off bill, bells and whistles and alarms that's just not necessary. That's a breakdown in communication and it de definitely does not exhibit good leadership. Um, and it's very worrisome. Uh, when there is an email that's sent out in the mornings about a survey and no one has a clue where that's come from. It was definitely not sent by the administration. It's not verified by the administration. We have no idea where it came from. Um, you know, when that survey came out, knowing that we have 4,500 employees in this system, we have over 2,400 teachers and 120 were surveyed, we don't know where that came from. We don't know what, you know, what person or group or whomever you know, actually conducted that survey and, and what's the validity behind it. That's a, that's a, that puts the board in a very bad place to go, okay, what, what does this actually mean? That, that's, that's going above and out of our realm of control of how we look at information. And it's definitely outside the guidelines and process. So with that being said, um, I would like to ask our board attorney to address it and how we would uh, need to look at this and what and if, if anything that we can do at this point. So Jay, may, may would you I come to the... I just want to be clear, Board Chair. I know that you, I, I know I know the answer, and I know what you're, you're specifying. But I'll be clear that you're not referencing the leadership of the Cabarrus County Administrative Team. You're mm -hmm. talking about something totally entirely different. Absolutely. I just want to be clear on that. And I, um, no, I I'm talking about the leadership of this board. Understood. Yeah. Um, and I also want to just close by saying I thank all of you for for your help and your assistance and your support that you give to us on a daily basis. Um, your help does help us. Secondly, I want to say you, you give a lot of accolades and thanks and appreciation this evening, and I do appreciate that, but the credit doesn't, doesn't belong with me. It belongs with our teachers and the people that are in the buildings every day that you saw speak today, our bus drivers, our cafeteria workers, our mechanics, our, our facilities folks, our custodians, all those folks you saw that we spoke of this evening. And then lastly, and, and mostly, again, I, can't, I just cannot, I can't compliment our teachers enough for doing the work they're doing on a daily basis. And then lastly, I want to say to you, I'm surrounded by wonderful people that helped me gather a lot of this data. So you, you made a request today, and I was blessed to be able to lean back on my cabinet who did extraordinary work today. And that would be Dr. Hill, Ms. Legrand, Ms. Hardin, Dr. Withers, Dr. Probst, Dr. Bish, um, and, and all those in, in that cabinet that helped me uh, gather this information today. So being surrounded with that excellence is is really truly humbling because without them I wouldn't be able to gather this information so the accolades deserve to go to other people not me because they they did all the support work in the background to help us provide you with that that information Stephen. and I thank them for that I did not miss a cabinet member did I I'm and, I'm, and I'm, I apologize she's new Dr. Withers um, and Dr. Withers also I, I apologize it's um, I'm laughing a little bit because we're all we're, we're all getting to know each other and we're all here a couple of weeks here and there we're all we're adjusting but um, to be frank, Dr. Dr. Withers was incredible in, in pulling a lot of that data together, especially on the substitute information. She is now um, the, the unverified expert on that. She doesn't know that, but it's a new job that she has, and I do appreciate the work that she's done. So thank you, Dr. Withers. Thank you, Dr. Kapiki, and thank you to all those that he uh, identified. And Jay, I would like for you to come to the podium. You know, one of the frustrations is you know we have spent two almost two and a half hours tonight on this and not that this wasn't going to be on an agenda at some point in time but it certainly took uh, some other business off of our agenda to be replaced and and to me and you know I'll let the rest of the board speak but it is concerning we have a process and I want you to speak to that of how information should be distributed what the role is and how we get information to the superintendent and it's transferred back to the board 
it's board policies you know the reasons that exist because there's so much stuff out there and yes we all all get emails and questions and some of us get it all and some get it individually and, and that that we understand that that's why there is a process of how this should take place and you know not to ever negate what the information is that you get because of course right now we have critical times with teachers and all that they're struggling with and shortages on substitutes but there's a football field of difference of saying you know that we have a problem and that we're addressing it and saying that we have zero substitutes or we have you know a certain piece of information that's just not really accurate we have got to be very very careful what we put out to the general public that is our job so Jay I will let you just go from there well, you've tasked me with a lot, and I'm going to try to address it as quick, as efficiently as I can. Well, I will tell the, uh, the board that one of the things we're going to talk about during the retreat is what is your role as a board member? What is it that you, as you get information, as you are contacted by the public? Because y'all are the um, feet on the ground and the front line in regards to the public coming up and saying, hey, I've got an issue. What do I do with this? So we're going to talk about that more in the board retreat, but as an oversight, as a very quick view, is I would tell you that it would be best to pass it back to the, um, the best person to address the issue. For instance, if it's uh, my child, Johnny, um, is having a problem in, in math, um, and what, what can you do about that? It, that should go back to the teacher, back to the principal, not go straight to y'all for a s solution because it's something that you may be hearing later down the road. It certainly should not go to Dr. Kapicki at this point in time because, again, it's what, where's the issue? And if it doesn't get addressed, then it starts elevating from there. So I would tell you that it, that it goes from there. Now, information that comes to the board that the board is working on, masking, um, teacher issues, um, those kind of things, I would tell you that that ought to be um, directed through to the superintendent, Dr. Kopicki, but also to the chair so that it could be a funnel of information and it's consistent information as to how best to address it so that that topic can be brought up at the next meeting or as quickly as possible if it's an emergency meeting. We talked about that last time. It could be addressed at an emergency meeting or a specially called meeting other than the meetings that, that have already been scheduled. so that. That is the best way to be most efficient with the resource of information instead of getting information on a th Thursday um, outside of the typical channels and the most efficient channels and then having to scramble over the weekend, get everything together, get presentations done, get all the information addressed so that, that it, cre it affects the, the it impacts the effect effectiveness of the board. Now the question is, when misinformation is given out to the public, the question then becomes is, what does this board decide? At what level um, does that impact the board? What impact, how much impact is that on the administration? Um, overall, an organization such as the Cabarrus County uh, School System has a right to enforce the policies um, and, to, um, and to also um, um, Con or, uh, address behavior of a board member or conduct that's injurious to the organization or its purposes. So the question is, at what level? So you could do nothing, that's one level, or you could censure, which is the other, or you could do something in the middle saying, we believe it's not a censure, we believe it's more than not doing anything. We, there needs to be an apology because a lot of time and energy has been expended to try and address something outside of what the normal is. So that you have that. Now you're, you're looking at that in, uh, in a pocket of, or in, in, in a guidance of policy 2120, which is the board members um, code of ethics. And that is codified in the general statutes uh, so that you have an, uh, an, an ethical requirement to uphold the integrity and the independence of the member's office, uh, to avoid impropriety, um, in the boards and the board members' official duties, and then you have an, an individual commitment that you that you should have signed that says that you're not supposed to any, take any private action that compromises the board or the administration, um, <coughs> along with other things. So you're looking at that in regards to whatever you can. Do, well, whatever you do, you're basing your decision on those, um, and the decision could be: we'll do nothing. We will. Um, we'll ask for an apology or we will ask for a censure. So those are the things this board can do if that's what the board would like to do. I hope that answers everything that you've asked. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. 
Uh, Madam Chair, uh, based on the information that we have received tonight, um, that has been specified by Chairman Grimsley, Superintendent Kapicki, and Attorney Jay White, I would like to make a motion to amend the agenda for the censure of Ms. Ke Keisha Sandage. I have a motion to amend the, the agenda to add a discussion for the censure. Do I have a second? I'll second that. I have a motion by Ms. Blackwell, a second by Mr. Furr. I would ask that all that agree to raise their right hand. So seeing three, that means we that motion fails. So we will leave the agenda as is. I would ask if there are any more comments by board members or any discussion items that you would like to have regarding this situation. And Ms. Adcock, I will just begin with you. Um, I think one of the things I'd just like to clarify is, since this is all just come up in this meeting, is this something that can be addressed at a later point in time? I mean, I didn't know about any of this until this, this meeting at this Well, we moment. have to have this at a public meeting. This is not anything that meets the guidelines on closed sessions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I did call all of you and let you know that there was going to be a ch um, report ran on 46, that there was some misinformation given out and that we were having to do some damage control, if you will, or negate some information that went out that wasn't quite accurate. So with that, you were apprised. But the conversation and the actual con discussion of it has to be done in open session. Yeah, before I, understand. The I understand that. Thank okay. you. Ms. Carpenter? Yes, and, and Jay just mentioned, said we were going to talk about all this stuff, talk about things at our retreat. And I think that, you know, it is things talking about the policies and things like that. I think this is something that, uh, you know, Keisha and Denise both, are rather new members and I think it's something that can be discussed at the retreat looking at policies looking at things like that and I think that that's something that we can all review look at things and that is public and I just want to say sunshine is the best disinfectant and I think and that's why you call it a sunshine policy and so let's discuss that and that is open to the public Thank you, and I just want, for clarification, this was an amendment to amend the agenda to have the discussion to do it, okay? It was not to do the censure. It was to amend the agenda to add the discussion for any type of, any, any repercussion or anything that we would discuss, just the discussion. Only the amendment of the agenda was the motion on the floor, okay? So just for clarification, just so you know that that was the amendment on the floor, it was not to actually take action, okay? So Ms. Blackwell, do you have any other comments? Um, I, I mean, I do have, I, are we, is it possible for us to, to ask questions? Um, Ms. Sandage, I'm just curious to know, with this information that you had been given, um, that was provided to you, why was the first reaction that you had to go to the local media rather than making sure that that information was accurate? So I explain this on in the media as well, but I'll explain it for you again. So I receive lots of comments and texts, you, you name it, from teachers just complaining about what's happening in our system. And when I read that report from Forbes, it spoke to that exact same thing. Teachers are having a very difficult time these days and as you guys have all so eloquently stated, it's happening across our district. So I made an appoint as a parent and as a board member to point that out to our community so that we can start showing our appreciation for teachers all across the board. I have remained in my stance that I am going to be transparent regardless of who likes it or who doesn't like it. And I'm always going to be able to be held accountable for the things that I did, that I do wrong. I hope I answered your question. 
Yes, thank you. Uh huh. Mr. Farr. Oh, yes. Okay, so the motion was just to amend the agenda to have a discussion. So since we're not going to amend the agenda to have a discussion, then there's really nothing to t talk about at this moment. But we can address it in the future. Absolutely. Or I, I'm allowing a point of order, a point for preference for the floor if you want to make a yeah. statement or well, ask a question. Well, the thing, too, and, and it's something maybe we need to clear up. I mean, I've been on the board since 2008, off and on, for three terms. And historically, and I'd have to look at policy, but the board chair usually speaks to the media, not every one of us. Because if all seven of us go to the media with seven different stories, I mean, all we need is a circus stamp because the circus would be in town, so you don't want that. We want a spokesperson, and, and that's just what's got to happen, regardless of, of how you feel and I can say this or I can say that. When you're on a, a board like that, you can't do that. You have to, there's guidelines and procedures to get the message out, and uh, I think it's something that we're definitely uh, going to have to address at some point because it's become a pattern, uh, you know, since the summer. This is not the first time, so uh, it, needs, it needs to be addressed at some point, that's all. Mr. Walter? Yeah, I think we need to define what policy was violated, exactly how it was violated, put that in writing so we have something ahead of time to discuss, not just discuss it off the cuff here. So if we could do that, we could put it on our agenda for future meeting. I'd appreciate that. So we'll have to have some discussion regarding that with the board attorney. I'm not sure if we can carry that forward through, but the problem, the, not the problem, the process is there are a lot of things that um, meet the criteria for having a closed session discussion. This is not one of them. Um, a board member is a public elected official. So if there's conduct or there's questions, it has to be discussed in open session. And I know that's an uncomfortable situation for all of us, but as board chair, I have no um, alternative there. Uh, the, it is by board policy that the, bo the board chair does represent and speak and is the spokesperson, and I've done quite a bad, bit of that this weekend. Um, it's just really important, you know, I had to speak to a couple of different reporters and of course several of my statements were cut off you know they 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 weren't completed you know when I said we have substitutes the next very next thing I said we have substitutes but we have challenges we do have substitutes are they where we want them to be absolutely not and the staff you know validated that tonight and I'm glad we did get to have some of this discussion T to me it is extremely important you know Miss Sandage myself as the board chair I would just ask if there's something there, you know, that is a hot button for you, and you're right, we all get them. We absolutely do. And, and it is every board member's right to have those questions answered and to ask for information. But it would be really good for process to be followed. You know, we've asked about emails, copy me, send it to me, copy Dr. Kapiki, send it to Dr. Kapiki, copy me. It keeps the thread of communication open versus I get a call by a reporter that says, you know, ex board member has said, you know, blah, what conversation now do we have with you to respond to that? It just puts me in a really bad place because number one, we, that was over the weekend. I didn't have that. We just came back last week. We didn't have numbers yet to validate what those concerns were. You know, so I had to call staff today and ask them to pull those together. They spent all day long pulling this information together, you know, because we just got back last week. Information showed we had more critical issues with absences the first part of the year than we did last week. And that's okay. And I get it that you get a lot of questions and emails we all do and we want to do a good job of talking to our constituents and making sure that teachers and parents feel very safe with what's going on <coughs> at school but we have to allow our administration which is their job to do their job and to get that information to us in a in a w an orderly way so that we can get that out to the community versus knee-jerk reactions that's just never a good place to go and it just sets off alarms in the community that just aren't necessary so I would just ask that if you have questions from now on always feel free that that's your job to do that but please just email those prior to talking with the media because that starts another section of events that we have to respond to in addition to the information that you're asking for 
So if we could just all know that continue the process, and we will have this uh, discussion at our uh, planning session. I know that there were, with the new board members, you probably didn't get a lot of the school board 101 that a lot of, of, us, of us did because of COVID. Um, but it is just really important. It mainstreams things. It doesn't put the administration on defense. They don't get involved in lots of media questions. I don't even know how many media resources called today. And not that they shouldn't. They want to know, is Cabarrus County experiencing something that's you know unique or different or worse than the other? their districts but that answer is no and we should all be very careful that we have that same message especially when that's what the administration is telling us you know I'm sure there's different schools that are experiencing you know more issues than others I think they spoke to that it's up to the administration and our principals to maintain those campuses and to, to take care of that if there's a critical situation that we're to be made aware of they bring that to us and we all know that and we have to we have to you know give them the benefit that they're going to continue to do that we do work as a team we need to continue to work as a team and when we go out, out of that path and we work as an individual board member and especially if we're saying something different from what everybody else is saying or we're causing some you know we're lighting the match to something instead of trying to be part of the resolution it's just never going to have a good end so I would just ask for us to all continue the same process that we do if you get a, a question Question, you know it needs to go to either Dr. Kapiki and copy me and the vice chair or it needs to go to me if it's a board related item and we copy Dr. Kapiki we are public entities everything we do is open to access to public information so there's never a time that we should feel uh, that we've got to you know hide something or we're not being transparent because we are we're going to be but we're not going to put out information that's not inaccurate not been vetted not been corrected and not been validated that is not fair to do that um, you know, the other issue is with that survey this morning, we had no idea where that survey came from. You know, we're not even sure now where it came from, you know, what the source is, what's the source behind it. We know that our administration is in the process of doing a survey for Cabarrus County Schools, which will come to us at our planning retreat. We already knew that. So I would just ask, in order to not get information out there, that we have to continuously do cam damage control, that we continue the process that we all know need to, to work with. Is that good? <coughs> okay, great. All right, thank you. Do I get to? Have sure, comments? absolutely. Awesome. All right, so transparency matters. When we have information that is detrimental to us as board members making a decision, that information should be shared. I received a survey yesterday and I sent it to this entire board today or whenever I sent it. It's an email and I sent it to this board to say, hey, I received this information. I wanted you guys to have it. That's important that we know what's going on. I think we also need to take a step back to, uh, you know, we all ran on different things in our campaign. And in my campaign, I said I was gonna be transparent. I said I would be accountable to what I am saying I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do that. I said I wanted to make sure all of our schools were safe, and I said I wanted our community to be a part of our decision making. Those things are happening, and those are the things that I'm signing on to. When I leave here today, I am going to stand grounded in what I have posted. I want our community to be a part of what we are doing, and I want them to know where we struggle, because in there lies how we fix problems. We cannot fix problems as a board and not communicating with our staff. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm just I'm sorry, one more thing. Okay. Since we are talking about this survey, um, are, is the public going to see that survey? We are referencing something that's not even put up. I'm, I'm not understanding how that's possible. I, I wanna speak to that first. This board is going to need to decide as a whole if that survey is valid information. That was a Facebook page survey. You know, I'm not sure. We have no idea who conducted it, how it was used, who was referenced. I'm not sure and not if that was a query of teachers that not all the teachers were queried. I'm not, I'm not sure and I think we would really have to ask our board attorney. I'm I'm not sure what you're asking of the board. I guess I'm, what I'm asking is we are referring to a survey in a public meeting that is not being shown. 
So it should not have been brought up in a public meeting if we're not going to show what we're talking about. Well, since you didn't bring is what it I'm tonight. saying. Okay, so let me, I'm going to call it right here because number one, you're the one that provided it, but we don't have access to it either. So I'm going to hold the discussion on it, okay? If the board collectively, you all received it, would like to know the validity of it, who, I mean, the, the source will have to be revealed. I think that was the discussion you had with the board attorney. That will have to be revealed. The, the people that were, that actually conducted it, we have to know the validity of the, of the source of who did conducted the survey. Who, who, who was asked, you know, what population of our staff was asked. You know, there's a lot of decisions that go into that. But I'm, we'll have that discussion with the board attorney to decide if that's a, a valid resource. Or I can ask the board members right now, is it something that you felt like um, was a valid resource or a valid survey or are we going to just go with the survey that the Cabarrus County Schools administration is conducting and will bring to us at the retreat. Ms. Adcock, I'll start with you. I'll just be honest. I think it's going to be very um, confusing if we have our administration that's doing a survey that really is something that we vetted, that our school leaders have vetted, that they have quality uh, people doing it. They also, uh, confidentiality is protected of the staff because that's, that's very important. And then everyone gets an opportunity to fill it out and give their response. So I would say no. Ms. Carpenter. Uh, from my understanding, I mean, did we not pay for that survey? We're, t we're talking, no, wait a minute, let's, no, oh, wow. I mean, hold the confusion. We're oh, okay. talking about, are we going to use the survey that Ms. Sandage sent on the email this morning that evidently was done off of Facebook? This, the Cabarrus County School Survey that we will be getting is coming from its administration and staff, so yes. So when we're talking about transparency on surveys, <coughs> and I'm assuming that's what Ms. Sandage is referencing, we, we I, I definitely, as the board chair, feel like facts mean more to me. I've got to know that that was vetted through our Cabarrus County school systems like we've always done and that everybody was given an opportunity to look at that and respond to questions. What I'm asking you now is do you want to, to have that looked into? The source will have to be revealed, the people will have to be revealed, she'll have to provide that and who they who they did survey. We, did, we still don't know even know who they surveyed. No, uh, I agree with you. I would want verification on anything. Right. So I, you, I want facts. Right, so are you wanting to have her provide that to the board or do you want to continue on with the Cabarrus County Schools survey that we were in the middle of doing that'll come to us at the retreat is the question. Well, no, I mean, we've gone, we've gone a long ways on the Cabarrus County, you know. It's not going to take the place of it. I'm just asking, do you want that in addition to come to the, to, to the board as a whole as that particular survey result? I'd like to see what it well, is, but it. it was it was sent to you in an email. I mean, no, I'd like verification on it. I'm just not going to just hunt, you know say, hey, yeah, that's great. I would like verification on it, but I don't want to stop what we're doing. We're not going to stop. Uh, what oh, we're okay, doing. but yeah, if we're going to use it as a comparison, I want some verification on it. Yeah, so we're even going to consider. We have, and I'm assuming it was just of teachers in that survey that came to us in an email this morning. Um, by Ms. Sandage, and I, I'm like I said, I, I'm not even sure where the source came from, but there were only like 113 responses. You know, we have 4,500 employees, we have 2,400 teachers, so I, you know, I worry that that did not go out to every single teacher if that's what was going to take place. Um, so, there, therefore, the sources have got to be revealed, the people have got to be revealed, and where that's, it was that who, taken who at, was asked those questions. who was asked, I right. want verification right. before I even would consider it. Do you think it's it. worthy of having that, or the, to me, those those same people should be in our Cabarrus County School Survey that's going to take place. So, you know, that's why I said I prefer to make Before sure I would consider it, I'd want to know those information before I would even consider it. Right. Okay. Ms. Blackwell. Um, I prefer to just have the, uh, the one that Dr. Probst has been working on so diligently, and I would like to have that one be the one that is our primary focus um, <coughs> with Facebook surveys, not knowing where they came from, not knowing what audience um, they were from. I just don't feel like that's going to be an accurate portrayal of the information that we're going to get from the Cabarrus County Schools uh, survey. So I'd prefer to have that one. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Ferg. 
yeah, I just can't really believe we're having this conversation. So, yeah, I think I'll go home and Facebook 125 of my friends and get them to see things the way I do it. We got to do, there's only one survey, it's Cabarrus County Schools. The others are, to me, are non-existent. We shouldn't even be wasting our time even discussing that survey. They're going to do one. I mean, you had 120 some out of 4,000. So we, we know, I mean, probably 2% of the teachers in Cabarrus County probably saw that. That's not a real survey. That's someone's personal opinion that probably sent to people that are like-minded. So no. Mr. Walter. All right, we get petitions, we get emails, we get all kinds of stuff all the time. I mean, we can have discretion on reviewing it if we want to review it or not. It's now apparently in our email. I have, I have not looked at it yet, um, but apparently it's public information now. So if somebody wants to see it, they can see it. Apparently it's a public group. If they want to look at it, they can look at it. Well, we've obviously hired a, a group to give us a survey. We're going to be evaluating. We're going to spend our time with that. I mean, it's just like anything else. If you have an issue with us, you want to share what information on COVID or whatever, share it with us. I don't care. Okay, here in the majority of the board, I would say that we are not going to entertain adding that to an agenda item. And, you know, I do, I do, I believe that it's, we have to do our due diligence when we put information out to the general public. There's going to be a lot of time and effort that's going to be placed into that uh, Cabarrus County Schools survey and ensuring that all staff, all teachers, you know, all employees are surveyed, you know, for, for uh, various questions and information so that when we get that report, we know that no one was left out. Everyone had an opportunity to, to uh, answer those questions and to give us an idea of where, where we think we are and how our employees are feeling. So with that being said, I'm not going to add it for any further discussion. And uh, so I'd just like to clarify, I didn't get to speak. Rob spoken then. It's okay if I speak. Sure. So just to clarify, it was not a Facebook survey. It was a survey that was sent to my Cabarrus County email that I shared with the board. So let's take Facebook off of the table. And it was completed by one of our CCS staff. I shared that with the board for information. Just wanted to clarify that. Okay, so can you reveal the source now? I mean, if that's it had to come from somewhere it did not it was not performed by Cabarrus County Schools it was not performed by Cabarrus County Schools what I am telling you is it came from a Cabarrus County School staff to my public email if you want to request that somewhere feel free to do that however what I'm saying is we're discussing it but we're not discussing it it's not even up for folks to see so why are we spending this much time but if we decided no not to Right. discuss it but there's no disclosure on that where it came from so how do we say where it came from we have to be able to identify the the source of where that survey came from there's not there's no names there's no there's nothing it, how do we know who was surveyed is what i'm asking how do we know who was surveyed we know very clearly in hours it's going to take place everybody was surveyed that's the whole goal we don't know who those people are that are even surveyed we're not sure how valid that information is i'm not saying it's not but i'm just saying how do we inform this board if they're going to review information that very clearly states where it's coming from when it's presented to us where that survey came from and who conduct who conducted it and who actually answered it so again i received the survey on our my board email and i sent it to the rest of the board for information <coughs> Now, if the rest of the board wanted to ask me who that information came from, which, to be honest with you, that's more irrelevant than what is relevant, is that we have a survey from, it looks like teachers. We should be asking questions about where these issues lie, as opposed to trying to figure out the source so and target that source in a public meeting. But we have to know the source because if it, it we don't know where it came from to, to confirm how valid it is, that it would be substantiated information. I mean, and evidently those same people will be given an opportunity to answer the survey that will be provided through the Cabarrus County School System that will come to us. So I'm thinking that is probably more prevalent than getting a source that we still not sure where it came from and who answered the questions. Yeah, my concern is that we're using a public meeting to discuss a topic 
that we've decided not to discuss, but also give the public information that we are not sharing with them totality. But you in totality. Are me to so edit we shouldn't have even picked up the sub survey to begin with. Okay. It shouldn't have been brought up by you to begin with. Okay, I'm what gonna, I'm saying. I'm gonna, uh, that's fine. What I was saying is you were asking me to add it for a discussion at a later date. I've got to know if that's what the board would like to do. That's the way I have to do that to set an agenda, but it's okay. I heard the majority of the board say no, so that's where we're just going to leave it, okay? And thank you for your comments. Yep. Okay, so let's move on. We have Jay with 11.01 board turn attorney reports. Did you have anything tonight? No, Okay, thank you. And we actually decided that we would move 11.02 committee reports uh, from board members to February. So now we will move to 11.03, which is the Cabarrus County Schools COVID-19 data and information update by Dr. Kapiki. Thank you. Again, this is our monthly update on the COVID-19 metric. <clears throat> Currently, the positivity rate in the county of Cabarrus is 27.2%, which puts us in the red. The case count in Cabarrus County is 4,124, again in the red. The weekly percentage of cases that are COVID positive in the Cabarrus County school system is 426 this week, and the quarantines are 1,238. Another graph looking at the 27.2% positivity rate in our county. The CDC data tracker that we show you shows the positivity rate slightly higher. The case counts again, the reference that the CHA uses for the 4,124 cases. The data that we show indicating the quarantines and the positivity rates, excuse me, the positive cases of COVID with the red line separating when we became mask optional. This is the graph that we have shown consistently from August 23rd to January 3rd, giving you the positive data across the system, the quarantines, and those that are turning positive from the quarantines. Same data, different graph. This is the data that we're showing mask mandatory compared to mask optional. We have both the confirmed positive cases, the average, the high and the low. And then we also have the quarantines, the average, the high and the low, along with the clusters located on the bottom. I'm gonna pause there and ask John Basley to come up and give you the quick review of the new information that was sent out by the state and the toolkit and then update and review on what he has already covered with the board thus far. Okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Um, we're going to go over some quick reminders. Uh, as Dr. Kapicki said, they updated the toolkit on Friday afternoon. I wanted to make sure you all were aware of those, those updates. Um, this on top of the information that they updated the previous week, I just want to make sure you and the public are aware of um, what the expectations are. So just a reminder, moving forward, um, we are looking, and currently we're looking at five and five. That's five days out of school for um, being symptomatic, COVID positive or close contact, and five days back um, on campus, but you have to wear a mask for those five days. Um, for those who are required to, um, to quarantine as close contacts, those are unvaccinated um, people who are within six feet for 15 minutes or more in a 24 hour period of a COVID positive or symptomatic person. Um, um, more of the same thing, I'm saying the same thing here basically that um, it's, it's uh, stay home for five days, come back in a mask for five days. Again, those are the requirements from the toolkit. Those are not discretionary. We are not, that is not our option to, to choose to do that. That's what we're compelled to do. Um, one of the uh, changes that I've listed here was that they've revised the age for when the booster comes into play for somebody being quarantined to 18. When we met last time, that age was 16. Since then, um, they've raised that age to anyone over 18. So this will primarily apply to our staff and to a small segment of our students, okay? Um, 
And then, um, let's see, uh, there's still the exclusion for people who have the antibodies who are COVID positive in the last 90 days. Again, people must be asymptomatic and um, even when they return from being in close contact, the expectation is that they'll wear a mask for 10 days. And this is how they, we avoid uh, you know, excluding people from school, from quarantining them. So the same is true for people without symptoms. What we do is we count from the time of their initial COVID test, five days out, five days back in a mask. And then for confirmed COVID uh, positive people with symptoms, they stay home for five days from the time of the onset of their symptoms. They have to be fever free for 24 hours and improving. And then we go um, five days from those, those, uh, those initial symptoms, five days back in a mask. All right. If a staff member or student has been symptomatic, they should get tested if possible. Um, this should be done regardless of vaccination status, as we've heard of breakthrough cases. And if testing is not possible, parents should contact the school nurse and staff should contact human resources and treat as if it's a positive. Okay. One clarification I wanna make that was very important is we're saying five days out, five days back in a mask. So if somebody um, is unable to wear a mask, um, they can stay out for the entire 10 days and those absences will be excused. We are not gonna penalize anybody for um, an inability to wear a mask. So this is just a quick recap of when we start, um, uh, basically the clock on when um, you're counting those five days for close contacts. It's the time of last exposure. From, for asymptomatic people who are positive, it's from the time of the test. And from, uh, for symptomatic people, it's from the time of symptom onset, provided they're fever free for 24 hours and improving. Now, a couple of quick revisions. These are the revisions that came out on Friday. Uh, Friday afternoon. Most notably, I mentioned a moment ago, boosters. Um, the exemption now pertains only to people who are 18 and over, needing that third shot, that booster. Um, the time frame, the time frame, however, for boosters has their availability has been um, revised to five months from the last dose, and um, they're encouraged for people 12 and up. They're not required, but they are encouraged. A big change has been in the test to stay program. So the test to stay program in universal mask settings for close contacts during lunch or extracurriculars, there is no longer a requirement for quarantine if schools are in that circumstance. Now I say that knowing that we are not in that circumstance, but I would be remiss if I didn't alert you to that, okay? So this is the text from the bottom of page 16 of the toolkit that outlines um, the, uh, this exemption for universal masking in a test to stay environment. I wanted to make sure that you all had that information in front of you. Um, that basically says the, the quarantines we used to do at lunch when we were universally masked in the first quarter would no longer be in play. Quick update on our test to stay program as, we, um, as you may recall from our last meeting, well, the last slide the Health Alliance shared with you is that if we remained in a mask optional setting and our um, positivity rate remained high, that they would um, uh, effectively recommend that we no longer uh, participate in the test to stay program. As a result of that recommendation, our test to stay program is on pause. For right now, it is uh, temporarily suspended. For us to be able to move forward the test to stay, we need the approval of our local health department. So for right now, it's, it's, uh, it's temporarily suspended. You, and I'm here for questions if you have them. Um, actually, if, if we could, just because we have these um, presenters in the room, could we go ahead and have those presented first and yeah. then we can come back to this? Whatever you need. I think everyone probably needs to take a pause on the information anyway. So of course. let's do the presenters first. Okay. Mr. Taylor is going to present now an update on the cleaning procedures and sanitation procedures of the district. Mr. Taylor.
Good evening again. Next slide, please. So you have up on the screens two definitions. Cleaning is the process that we use, and I'm paraphrasing just to speed this up just a little bit, is the method that we remove the materials that may be carrying the virus. Okay, disinfecting is where we're actually killing the virus. The importance of these two terms will be more clear on the next slide once we go to it, please. Uh, and I'm gonna go over these individual areas quickly and as precisely as I can, okay? So in restroom areas, they're closed for short durations throughout the day. We're sanitizing it. One of the things that comes up, questions that I'm asked a lot are how are we doing this? We have provided the schools, we started out at the beginning of the pandemic with one of the uh, static sprayers, okay? These static sprayers are important because by putting that charge on the material we're cleaning with, which is a material called HP202. HP202 is a watered down version of hydrogen peroxide. It's a very basic cleaning compound. It's very good at doing its job. And what we found is it has a one minute dwell time. That's important for cleaning your classrooms between classes and being able to be efficient and move through the day. The restrooms are clean with this as well. The static sprayers, when they spray it, it actually clings to the surfaces. That's the importance of that. Deep cleaning is once a day, but I can tell you our custodians, as I was saying earlier, are very vigilant. They're they're cleaning these restrooms as often as possible throughout the day. Uh, isolation rooms, in other words, the areas where if we have a student or someone who is exhibiting signs of sickness, where they're taken to until they can go home. If any uh, anyone is identified and in that area, they, that area is immediately cleaned as soon as they leave. High touch areas, high touch areas are very important because passing this virus on through uh, close contact, doorknobs, keyboards, anything, desktops, all of these areas are being cleaned constantly all day long. We are actually more stringent in our requirements than strong schools. North Carolina strong school says clean daily we're cleaning between every class. That's what we're asking and requiring. That's one of the things Dr. Kopicki's talking about, the teachers are being required to do more in their day. They have to take that time out to help us keep it clean. One team, one fight, right? Find a way or make one. All right, classrooms. They're cleaned and disinfected between class changes. Uh, a lot of times in the, the planning periods, the block periods, they have open classroom times. The custodians know this. They get into the classrooms and clean it as well as they can. Those custodians are moving constantly all day long. They're never stopping. Personal areas. Now I'll get on here, if you touch it, you must clean it, okay? This is the pandemic. This is not a normal average time for us. Everyone has to be responsible. Everyone has to clean their own personal areas. This is not the time to uh, be too important to do any job. We all have to do our part. Personal areas are very important because that's where we feel safe, right? So we make sure we have an abundance of supplies. The one thing I can tell you for sure is from the beginning of this pandemic to now, we have had more than enough materials on hand. And at this point in time, I'm receiving less than two requests a week for materials. It's a lot less than when it began. And that's because we've established burn rates. We know how much material we need. We know what PPE we need. 
They have it at the schools. We know how much to order. They know how much to request. That's why I'm receiving less requests every week. Carpets. Uh, carpets are important because they can hold a lot of things uh, as far as viruses, contaminants, materials like that. They're being cleaned daily when possible. We're asking our custodians, teachers to do a lot of things. I think they're meeting the challenge. Uh, it's, it's very important to me, and I keep saying this because I have heard comments that we don't have enough cleaning supplies in schools. Show me where we don't have enough cleaning supplies in school. I, I challenge any of you to do that because it's not possible. I know we have enough in there. I know we purchase enough. I know we supply enough. The one thing I do know, the man I count on that, my Mr. Miracle, make sure that stuff gets out. Every email request I get, I can guarantee you within an hour, he's responded to it. And he's telling you, whoever's requesting it, that it's on the way. And with that, I'll leave it to you for whatever questions you have when we're finished. All right, board members, with that, we will open up for discussion items, and I will begin with Ms. Sandage. So we are questioning the uh, information that was just presented by John. Right. Do you okay. need him to come back to do anything different? We he, just I knew that the, there were board members that asked about the cleaning process, which really does work with that as well. So we just I gotcha. wanted that piece of it done at that point in time. Yeah, I've got questions. Sorry. That's right. Thank you. I truly appreciate your work on all of this. I know it takes a lot. Sure, sure. So the five and five. Okay, okay so um, I'm out five days. I come back five days. And a mask optional situation, I got to wear a mask for five days. I truly want to understand how that is captured. Like, how do we make sure that that's happening for that one individual without singling them out? So what, what I'll say about that is that um, the way that the toolkit is written currently, um, and that it includes presumptive positives who are not confirmed, close contacts, as well as positive students, you have three different groups of, of students. Um, and if I were to add um, anybody's name to a, to a list for teachers to review, we're not saying that any one of them has COVID necessarily. So one of the things we have is we've, um, basically given a template for principals to be able to share with their staff the name of students who for this for today need to need to still be in masks without identifying their medical status at all just saying something that just says the following students need to remain in masks through today or through friday or something of that nature okay and then um, i want to understand about sure. the test to stay sure um, because i thought that that was just a suggestion i didn't know that that was oh we're going to um, pause the program. Where, when did that happen? What? what uh, yeah, explain. Okay, please. sure, sure. So any any school district that participates in test to stay must have the approval of their local health department. So it's. I think you guys have heard me say something corny like it takes all yeses or one no, right? It's kind of the way I phrase things sometimes. Um, we need everybody to to agree and. Um, with the positivity rate being as high as it is, I, I heard the, uh, the public health officials say on that last slide that, that if they would, um, they would recommend that we no longer participate in test to stay um, if we remained in a mask optional situation. We remain in a mask optional situation. So that was on, I, the board meeting was Tuesday night of last week. So on Wednesday morning, um, we, um, we were informed that we would t temporarily be suspending our test to stay program. So how does that change? Just the health department saying, hey, you guys can do it again or like what? Yeah, so I'm sure that it would be a, um, you know, I'm sure there'd be a relatively, sh you know, short conversation to say what the status um, would be. I, I believe their slide said something to the effect of 
um, either the rate was under 8% or 740 <coughs> cases for a period of 14 days or more, um, or if we were in a mask, in a universal masking situation, then we certainly could have that conversation with the, the, um, with the health alliance, and I'm, I'm, I'm confident that they would reinstate the test to stay program. All right, last question. So all of the testing kits that we have in our storage, where are those being utilized some way, somehow? So if you're asking about the specific test to stay kits that came from Duke, I can't say specifically what's happening with them right now. It's my hope that we're holding on to them with the, um, the belief that we'll be, you know, relaunching test to stay in the, in the near future. Okay, so that brings about another question. I'm hoping that those tests don't expire yeah. while we're waiting on that. I don't think they will. So okay, I know good. that there was a concern about the uh, Bionex now all expired in December. The Quidel, I think, um, have a little bit longer or, or a little bit more current. Um, I have every confidence they'll monitor that and, you know, ship them back. I'm sure they'll ship them back long before they allow them to expire. I mean, they're, they're, they're good resource managers. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Mr. Walter. Um, thanks, John. Sure. Last week he said, unvaccinated students and staff who have been within six feet of a COVID positive person for 15 minutes or more during a 24 hour period in which either or both <coughs> parties were not wearing a mask have to quarantine. You had a slide you put up here just now, two slides, I guess, to the end that said that doesn't happen to be the case. Is that? Oh, if it's a lunch period, is, what, what is, explain I see, that. I see, are you talking about the one, the, uh, the your second to last slide, it was sure. in red. Okay. Or right. the one before that, I don't know, but however. Okay. okay. So in terms of quarantine, um, if you're, if, um, if we're, if you have a vaccinated person, um, they, 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 don't, they, they, don't, quarantine. they don't have to, they do this not have to quarantine. For, for, but this here in red, what this is saying is if you are in a, universal masking um, uh, district, and you're in test to stay, you no longer have to do the lunch lunchroom um, quarantine or the extracurricular quarantine. You, the only students that have to be quarantined as close contacts are close contacts to people who have a COVID positive person in their household, and of course, symptomatic and COVID positive people, right? So if you're COVID positive or symptomatic of COVID, then you're not coming to school, you never were, since we've been doing COVID, right? And so if you're a close contact in the household, those are the only people who can't be in school. School-based exposures are not, um, in a test to stay environment, are not required. But you're, they're saying if you had the universal masking, there wouldn't be a test to stay. Is that what they said last well, week? Well, you, you could still have test to stay in a universal masking. Um, that's, not what the, that's not what they told you last week uh, on TV. They wanted to eliminate that. Oh, so I, I'll have to go back and, uh, you know, uh, Rob, I'll have to go back and watch that to make sure I... I said it wasn't necessary because you had the five and five. At least that was my, what I heard. From, well, so... What uh, I heard them say. Yeah, so what I would say about that is the big thing about test to stay is the stay part, right? The big payoff is the stay, right? So the five and five, you'd be out for five days. For many families, that's untenable. We want to, they want their children to be in school for those five days. And, Quite frankly, we all want our kids in school, um, and so um, so maybe it, maybe it's a miscommunication. I'm not sure. Um, the benefit of a test to stay program would be that the kids would be able to stay for without those five any days. days without any days out. Without any without any days out, unless they're COVID positive, symptomatic, or have a COVID positive symptomatic person at home. All right, the whole thing is can, kind of confusing. So it is a little. I, I understand that. Um, I understand that. I do. Okay. And your other report, I guess one of these other pages said we have 1,338 students on quarantine. Is that correct? That's correct. As of this, that, so that those are the data from Friday. That was our Friday quarantine number. Yes. <coughs> on Friday. Is that, is that the highest we've had? Yes. So wait, can I qualify that? Yes. It's the highest we've had while we've been in session. Technically, when we're when when all of the kids were out of school and in the beginning of the pandemic, you had 34,000 students who were effectively in quarantine. But since we've been back in session, and, and yeah, that's that's unacceptable because we're talking two percent. What was the percentage that actually had got COVID that were out? So, um, I believe the number was uh, 430 some odd. So I so, uh, so it's it's not it's not quite half. It's 
somewhere in the near um, a third of the number out. You know, I think the ratio is about one to three. Uh, one whatever to the number to was, it was way too. Most of the kids that are quarantined did never come down with COVID. Right. And that's such. It's just not. Like, I understand. I, I have a hard time with that. Okay. Um, and I guess my last question: These masks here. I guess yes, I'm, I'm doing. Do we provide those to students? Do we do we have enough of these things out? Because how, how, they're I, telling us the cloth masks don't work. Yeah. These work, I guess. I don't know. So I would defer to, to Mr. Taylor on that. But what I would tell you is, he's he's never let us down on masks, right? And in the entire pandemic, he's here, always here. He, here um, he comes. He can tell us what our supply of these things are. <coughs> I'm sorry. Could you restate your question, sir? These masks that I'm wearing now, I guess they're whatever double layered better than the cloth mask or whatever acceptable they do are we they're, provide, they're much we better than the cloth do we mask. provide those to students do we have an in, in do we have how big of an inventory do we have we have plenty to go for any all the requests that we have that's a part of that well, burn what, what, is, what is but what does that mean i mean if I, we required students to wear these masks do we have enough to provide yes sir we have enough to provide thirty thousand students yes sir thirty three thousand as a matter of fact yeah so I'm not choosing not to not to do this. So anyway, um, okay. And actually, just uh, for a quick update, since I have you all captive here, uh, my Mr. Miracle has found a mask that's actually three ply that we're paying the exact same price for. So we're getting an even better mask than is required for the same money. So we can get thousands of these things. Yes, sir. Tens of thousands. That you, you'd need ten. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Fur. Yeah, I don't really have anything except that, you know, uh, some of us get accused of never listening to science, but everything I have read in the last three days is where the N95 mask is the only mask that works on this variant. So we're not going to provide every student with N95 mask. That's just not going to happen. Right, I, I don't think so. What's a, you know? So what science is right? I guess it's a, it's the same questions we've been asking for a year. So sure. I have nothing. Okay, thank you, Ms. Blackwell. I don't have any questions. Thank you, okay. Ms. Carpenter. And and uh, Chuck, do we have any N95s for our teachers? I'm giving you getting your exercise in here because some of the teachers had even said asked about that. I'm having to pay all this money for N ninety fives and I didn't know if we had any of those available for our teachers. Ma'am, we can get N ninety five masks if that's what you require, but you need to know that uh, by OSHA regulation, if we provide N ninety five masks, everyone will have to go through a respirator fit test and exam. So there will be additional expense and cost to that. And I don't believe the N95 is going to do anything for you that the three-ply masks that we're getting now are going to do. I just don't see that you're getting any value for what you're investing there. If we, if Unless the medical professionals come out and say you have to have that N95 because that's actually classified as a respirator. Okay, but you said that three-ply because I know they mentioned the other day the two-ply would do just because this is a two ply and they stated that that would do, do just what? fine just do fine uh you know the only thing that was mentioned was about the cloth but they said the two ply was just fine and if both parties were wearing it you were getting the protection you needed yes, um and everybody's going to argue one point or the other uh so but that uh, that was just a question because one had come across about a teacher talking about how they had paid yes ma'am for that and that was just a question thank you thank you miss adcock perfect timing uh, mr basilis i can't tell you how disappointed i am to hear that the test today is gone i feel like that was a really great solution to decreasing our quarantines and decreasing our learning loss for our students um, and i just want to clarify that the Cabarrus uh, Health Alliance is saying that if kids are exposed during lunch, they're not going to be quarantined. So let me qualify that. So that is actually the, the North Carolina um, DHHS toolkit says that if we're in an, a universal mask environment and kids are exposed during lunch, they are not required 
and we and we were in the test back in the test to stay program, which I am confident that if we were in a universal mask environment, we would be back in a, in, a te, in test to stay. Then those kids would not need to quarantine during lunch. Those kids that were exposed during lunch would not need to quarantine. I'm I'm telling you that because not because it's my thinking that mm -hmm. that's what makes the most sense. It's because what I've read on page 16, the bottom of page 16 of the toolkit, it spells it out. Yeah. And I just have to say this, you know, insanity, the definition is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Um, that's all. Okay. So I just have a quick question. Um, I, I'm not sure where we'll be when we get ready to go to the action ag agenda item to vote, but so could we get the number of counties i know that everyone's got the number of counties that's mask optional and mask mandate but can we get the number of counties that are uh, using the test and stay that aren't mask mandate because i'm here and that's probably an individual health director in a county's decision we can we can certainly ask i can certainly ask the people at the abc science collaborative i i don't know if they if they um, share that information but we can certainly ask that right i mean even if we just get our surrounding counties yeah uh, you know, I mean, I want to know if that's a, a personal decision or if that's a state requirement that if you're not masked mandate, you, because I thought when we asked about the pilot program when this conversation was being had with the state is that was the whole point um, was when you were mask optional was that your op was your opportunity to participate in a, you know, a program that could keep kids in school there, um, you know, with that actually going on. But then, of course, during that time frame, if they were exposed, then, you know, they had to wear the mask. So that just to me is kind of a contradictory to what we heard to begin with. Yeah, so um, there's a, so a few things. First of all, I will certainly contact the folks at Duke and find out if they can share our surrounding counties or any North Carolina counties that are in a uh, mask optional um, uh, situation. Um, for each and every school district that participates in test to stay, you must have the approval of your board and your um, local health department. Those are, again, it takes all yeses. Um, the, the big appeal to us to begin with, of course, with test to stay was to um, increase the amount of time uh, kids would be able to remain in school. Based on my um, interactions with the, um, with the health department, um, it's clear to me that, that the current level of transmissibility of, the, of this virus, the positivity rate, um, I think for them it just became untenable for them to continue to be able to support it. So I think that's what um, resulted in their, the withdrawal of their support. I do believe that if we were in a mask um, mandated or a universal mask environment, I am quite confident that we'd be back in, um, in, a, uh, in the test to state program. I will definitely check to find out if I can tell you what other districts are, how many other districts are in the, uh, the mask optional setting for sure. And I'll do my best to get that to you within 24 hours. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you, John. Dr. Kapiki, do you have anything else before we move on to the other reports? No, ma'am. Okay, with that, we will move to 11.05, and we will have the Cabarrus County uh, Department of Human, Sor Human Services over you, and we will have Sharon Schooneman to the podium. And we would just like to say thank you for your patience and being with us in this longer evening than anticipated. So good evening, good evening. and if you will, just key your mic, and you will be ready to go. Just mm -hmm. push the button. Very good. Is that yes. okay? That's good. Um, well, thank you for having me. I'm, I appreciate, um, and I did this for Jay. Jay White asked me to be here, and I said I'll sit here for 10 hours if I have to. So, um, but I've been listening all evening, and this is my first time, so it was really interesting. But I wanted to say one thing I've learned is one team, one fight. I'm here tonight to, my, um, I'm a program administrator for um, Cabarrus County and child welfare and one of the things i wanted to say tonight is thank you to the school system um i work with amy jewel on a daily basis and i wanted to say thank you to all of the school the school counselors the um custodians everybody that works for the school system is instrumental in helping us in child welfare to keep children safe um, through the pandemic, it's been really difficult to keep children safe because we've had children out of school last year and 
but with the help and resources of um, the school system and the collaboration that we have together, um, we've built a strong relationship. And um, it's probably been, I have, we have one, um, Justice Johnson is our program one of our program managers. She's been there for 17 years. She couldn't be here tonight, but she wanted to really give a big shout out to Amy Jewell because she's worked with her for so many years. Um, but I just wanted to say with that, without them, I wanted to thank Amy Jewell, Aranda Dunlap, Doug, Doug Carr, and Jack, Jacobia Williams. They have been so instrumental these past years to help um, Cabarrus County. Um, we're just trying to do the best we can, child welfare, we're trying to keep kids safe. We, we collaborate with the, the school system. They, we have um, meetings that we come to. We talk about if they don't know how to make a report, um, how do you make a report? What's the best way to make a report? We have online reporting, so we share all that. And um, so really that's why I'm here tonight, to just thank, thank um, the school system for all the efforts they, they help us in child welfare. So, Ms. Gentleman, do you have any type of data that tells us, you know, statistics and numbers pre-COVID, uh, the reporting system when kids were out of school, now that they're back in school, how, how that looked before that? Um, that I haven't, I didn't bring any, but Paula Yost might have, she, okay. she's also here, Great. she's, she's a lady with the data. I'm here to say thank you. Oh, to, thank you. Okay. Yeah, and thank Sounds you, good. thank you all for, um, for having me and allowing me to come here tonight, but I just wanted to make sure that you, you all knew how, how much the school system collaborates with us, and we really, really appreciate that. Well, that is great. And I'll just ask board members if they want any comments or questions. Ms. Adcock? No, just thank you for what you do for our school system. We appreciate it. Thank you. Same here, and thank you for, for helping protect our children. Also, thank you for being here and appreciate what you do. Thank you. Yes, thanks for putting up with us for a long period of time tonight. Thank you. Sure. Same. I just want to say I understand what you and your team do on an everyday basis to keep the children in our county safe and that goes unnoticed sometimes so I want to thank you for working with our school district and making sure our kids are able to come to school in a safe environment and go to their communities and their homes in a safe environment as well so please thank your staff for us for me thank you thank you okay with that we'll say thank you for being with us tonight we will move to 11.06 uh, for a community update by Ms. Paula Yost, our Child Protection Team Chair. Good evening. And if you will key the mic as well, you are ready to go. Okay, beautiful. Hello. Um, thank you all for having me. Um, a few things. First of all, I also want to second thank you for getting these children back in school. And I'm going to talk periodically throughout my report real quick on why that is as important as it is. But thank you for getting them back in school. That is absolutely where they need to be. And I will go over some data with you about why. Um, first, I just want to explain what my role in the community is. So I chair Cabarrus County's Child Protection and Fatality Team. I've done this for eight years, um, rounding I'm almost there at number nine now. Um, our team is interdisciplinary, so we have representatives from, you know, basically any entity in Cabarrus County that could possibly touch a child, we have a representative on our team. So this is law enforcement, the district attorney's office, the Cabarrus Partnership for Children, the school system, um, our local LMEO, LME, MCO, mental health organizations, pediatricians, pretty much from everybody. We have them on speed dial and we review every fatality of a child that has occurred within the county. And we also look at global themes in child welfare to just say, what do we need to work on? Do we have anything consistently that's leading to child fatality or increase in child abuse numbers? Um, I actually have a lot of detailed fatalities, but I'm not going to give them to you tonight because the good news is that none of those fatalities that were an avoidable death occurred with any Cabarrus County school children. Um, everything that could have been on that radar occurred with a child zero to five, so that would be outside of your purview. And I'll be going into that with more detail with the Board of Commissioners when I report to them on March 7th. But for school system purposes, we're doing pretty good on not having child fatalities. We only had 18 um, fatalities of children during 2020. Um, and we run a year behind on our review. So we're looking pretty good, even though a huge part of that year impacted the um, COVID um, 
pandemic. Um, we do not have, we have not had any children die um, of COVID in Cabarrus County to date. And I knock on wood every time I say that. Um, a few things about how the pandemic did impact children. The first thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is child abuse reports and the quality of the reports. So during the period of time where children were not in school, the number one reporter for child abuse and neglect was law enforcement. We don't want that. We want the number one reporter to be the teachers because that's who it's always been. I've been doing this for almost nine years. Other than that period of time when children were not in school, I have never had a year where the number one reporter of child abuse and neglect in this county was not the Cabarrus County teachers. And that's really important. And it's important because I think that's the unsung thing that we don't say about our teachers and how important they are. They're the first line of defense. If a child comes in with a weird bruise, if a child comes in with a weird injury, if a child comes in talking about something that sounds like it might be sexual abuse, teachers are the people who hear that. They're the people that are on the phone with DHS. They're the people filling out online reporting. They're the people doing everything that they can do to get that child help. They're the people calling me saying, I don't know what to do. What do I do next? So that is an integral and critical role for child welfare. When we don't have have teachers doing that, what that means is that those children's level of abuse instances go way, way up. And then when we do see reports, it's coming from law enforcement, which means those children are badly injured at this point. And I'm just being honest about that. That's what it means. So thank you. Ever since the children got back into school, the teachers have gone back to be the number one reporter. And that means that the rates of overall impact and harm to children has gone down. Um, during 2021, Cabarrus County Investigations Report rose 742 reports. So they had a total, this is our county, 4,470 um, children were, or instances of child abuse were investigated by Cabarrus County DSS. That's up from 2020 when we had 3728. So that's an increase of 742 investigations. That's your Cabarrus County teachers. Um, for Cabarrus County cases, uh, so this is something that's hard for the general public to understand, but I'm sure Mr. White would agree with me on this. It is actually very, very difficult to get cases into child protective custody. Um, there's laws. You have a constitutional right to parent. It's one of the most sacred rights a human being has is their right to parent their children. And so in order for the state to be able to take custody of a child, it has to be something fairly significant. This isn't something that we just go off of with you know, undisputed documentation or reports or rumor or conjecture. These are things that we can prove through medical reports or various other collaterals. Um, of the investigations report, Cabarrus County accepted 1,038 cases, and out of those, 506 were forensic. A forensic case is a case where the child abuse is so bad or so suspected of being bad in terms of sexual abuse that the child has to be seen at the Jeff Gordon Children's Hospital. That number rose um, the year before, so in 2020, there were 412 forensic cases. Last year, there were 506, and that means that out of credible accepted cases for child abuse and neglect, 50% of them, 50% were forensic cases. So those are cases that are implying physical harm or sexual harm on children. Um, additional things that are interesting to know, out of those cases, 280 of them involve substance abuse allegations, and out of those cases, 69 or 25 percent of the substance abuse cases involved opioid use. So actually, that number's not as high as I would have thought it would have been. I was actually surprised to see that opioids were only 25 percent, considering everything we hear in the media about the opioid crisis, but that means that the rest of those cases were either alcohol abuse, marijuana, or some other form of substance. Um, and also there were 151 cases that were screened in for domestic violence, and that does not include cases where that were screened in for an injurious and injurious environment. So an injurious environment just means that the child is actually being exposed to some form of violence or hurt on their own. 
Um, Cabarrus County child abuse numbers, we had 43 families in in-home services. That's an important number, but let me explain what that means. So lots of our families, we get a, we get a report and the report gets screened in, but then what we realize is there's not child abuse and neglect happening here. These people are just living on the poverty line. There may be they're living in a van, they're homeless, they don't have food and clothing for their children, but that's a result of poverty. It's not a result of bad parenting or parents who don't love their children or for parents who aren't trying. Poverty in and of itself is not a reason for your children to be taken from your custody. So those children, we had 43 folks in in-home services. In-home services does everything that they can do to support those families financially and emotionally in order to give them resources. And we also had 161 children in foster care, which has increased from 152. Uh, in 2020 and we had 133 in 2019. So we've had a bump up each year in the number of children that are in foster care. I suspect that part of that is also just due to population growth in the county. It would be abnormal for a county as big as ours to probably have less than 100 children in foster care. I would be worried if we saw less than that, that we were having some kind of faulty reporting going on. So I'm not surprised that we have 161 children in foster care, but it's important for you to also understand that those children are in these schools. They're walking around in them every day and they already have a tremendous amount of trauma from the home life that brought them into foster care in the first place. So that is another reason why these teachers and school staff members are critical elements of children's lives. You don't know what some of these children have been exposed to in their home, what kind of violence and substance abuse they've observed, what kind of violence has been done against them that they have been an active victim of. And so for some of these children, you know, those teachers who won your awards earlier today, those are the most stable people that those children have in their lives. Those teachers are critical to them. And so when you take them away from their teacher, who's the one person in many of their lives who is their safe place, that is an additional trauma that is very detrimental to them and to their lives. Um, I also want to add that during the period of time when we were not in school, we saw an increase on our criminal docket in juvenile felonies of 85 to 90 percent where before they had just been like misdemeanors, like kids just fooling around and making bad decisions, they actually rose and became felonies. That was a drastic increase in the ratio of misdemeanors to felonies. And we believe it was because most of the crimes were happening during the day. The children were in an unsupervised environment because their parents were at work. And this is where I always preach the same song I preach every year. People in this county need to be responsible gun owners because a lot of these guns, when children wind up with guns, it's usually because they stole it from somebody, like an unlocked car. They're going through the mall, just opening car doors and seeing if there's a firearm in it. So if you travel with a firearm in your vehicle, please lock it so that children are not taking it. Um, I want to add, and I'm almost finished, that child abuse is everyone's problem. Um, sometimes I've heard things like, well, I mean, we, the school system's not DHS. You can't confuse the school system and DHS. Child abuse is everyone in this county's problem. Protecting children and child welfare triage is all of our problems, and it is impossible for us to protect children without the school system and the tremendous work that these teachers and other staff do every single day. Um, I know that there are teachers who probably never wanted to wind up in the realm of social work. Um, there's lots of everyone, I think, in the world in their profession who didn't want to wind up in the level of social work, but we're all doing it anyway. You know, we joke in the courthouse that the courthouse is mental health triage, but that's what it is. And sometimes it's the same case no matter what your profession is. Protection of child abuse is critical for everyone. Um, one last thing I wanted to talk about other than child abuse and other than um, fatality and just generalized crime prevention that is drastically negated by children being in school and being in the safe environment that is the school is our obesity rates. Um, as of right now, nearly one in three children in our community is classified as overweight or obese. In fact, the number is approximately 34% of our children are considered as having an obesity issue. Um, it is to the point where Atrium Health has actually opened a children's obesity clinic in Kannapolis. It's called the Atrium Health Levine Children's Healthy Futures Clinic, 
and Dr. Houston, um, who she was a pediat she was a very popular pediatrician at Suburban Pediatrics. She's won a number of awards um, through Atrium for her good service as a pediatrician. Um, she is in charge of this clinic. She is the head doctor there. They have three physicians and they do a lot of holistic treatment. So they do a lot of weight management, counseling, nutrition and education, exercise evaluations and support. But the most important point that I can make is on most of the obesity studies that were conducted like back in the early 90s there was this great study that was done and it was all on obesity and people would lose like a hundred pounds and then they would gain it right back and the PhD who ran that study had some of his folks come in and he said you know what's up with this you were doing so good like what made you quit and in an overwhelming percentage of those people they were all adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse that's what he found was an underlying theme. They were incest survivors or they were sexual assault victims. And that is how their trauma presented itself. That was a defense mechanism that many of them had. Once they were able to realize that and get into therapy, they did tremendously better. So a lot of this is, you know, sedentary lifestyle and poor diet, but some of this is also trauma and how trauma is presenting itself. And so it's very important that, um, you know, school does a great job. Is school going to cure obesity for everybody? Absolutely not. But if you're going to school, you're getting to run, you're getting PE, you're getting some structured outside time. You're also getting to eat and you're getting meals in what we hope is a healthy, reasonable experience instead of just, you know, being in front of a computer and eating whatever you have all day. So um, from our perspective in child welfare, we're very glad the children are back in school and I'm really hoping that they stay that way. So thank you very much for everything that you've done there. And I guess if you have questions, I can answer them. Okay, I'll open it up and I'll start with Ms. Sanders. Sure. Thank you for this information and the presentation. It helps to understand what's happening last year and compare it to this year. That's very important. Um, one of the statements that you made, uh, uh, which I really appreciate, and everybody that's come up to the podium today has talked about how wonderful our teachers are. I just want to tell you thank you for also pointing that out and making sure our teachers understand, our teachers and our staff understand how important they are to our community as a whole. Um, what, I will, what I wanted to ask was, um, when the when the school was out, you said that our numbers for felonies went up. Mm -hmm. Has that come down now, or do we not have that information? I do not have that information yet. Um, I am presenting a much larger, you guys are getting my abridged uh, 9, 10 o'clock at night version of this. The county commissioners is getting my extended <coughs> version on March 7th, and so I'll have that information for them. And um, of course, I invite any of you to watch it, listen to it, or I'll send you a link when it's done. But um, I am expecting that those rates have gone down. Um, I would hope so. It would be difficult for them to have gone up considering as high as they were. So my guess is that they have. The other important thing, probably the most important thing that you said tonight is that our kids must stay in our buildings. That is very important. And I'm glad that you acknowledge that as well. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Walter. Yeah, it's 10 o'clock at night, so but I do appreciate the update. It's been nice to that night came and talked to us again. Mr. Fur. Yes, as always, we, uh, we look forward when you come. You bring a lot of information that uh, in years gone by, we never really got it broke down like that. And one of the things that, that you said tonight, which, you know, resonates with me, is the fact I think you said something like uh, the most sacred constitutional right is, is for a parent to parent their child. And that that goes a that's, you know that's kind of what we're down here and and uh, I, I kind of base every well most of my decisions on that so thank you for confirming. Miss Blackwell, Tim, you took the words right out of my mouth, sir. That is what I wrote down right roll here. My, roll tide. Um, thank you, Miss Yost, for always coming and bringing us this information. It absolutely brings tears to my eyes when I listen to you talk and to think about the trauma that these children had had to go through when we were not in school. Um, that keeps me awake, that kept me awake all that year when these kids were virtual. 
to finally have some stats, some things that we had wondered and assumed had been happening during that time period, but now have some concrete information absolutely breaks my heart, but I'm grateful to have the information um, that you have presented to us. I will certainly be listening to um, the meeting when you present it to the county commissioners as well. So thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Ms. Carpenter. Yes, I have one question, and I want you to find out if they are doing it or have changed it. It used to be, and this has been years ago, probably before you were involved with it, but it was where if it was a biological parent and say that parent was living over in another county and say the mother was living in our county mm -hmm. and say the mother had had you know abused the child or something and social services had had come and invest investigated and everything they did not contact the biological parent and we had a situation where this actually happened in cabarrus county and the father was not notified that there had been complaints and everything and this child actually ended up getting you know killed and this was a small child and everything, but that father knew nothing about it, that there had been any complaints or anything. Mm -hmm. And of course he would have taken that child, come and got that child because he had joint custody of the child and everything. But there was, there's no, there was no law, and I don't know if that has changed or anything, but that biological, biological pa father had joint custody of the, you know, visitation rights and everything. He knew nothing about it because social services had not notified him. And he was one county of Mecklenburg Cabarrus. And no kind of nothing had been done. Has that law changed or well, the biological father being notified? That that was certainly before my time. Um, I don't remember ever reviewing a fatality that was what you just described, and I can assure you, I remember every fatality that has happened in this county. Oh, it would have been before at. your time, I yes. mean, and it did happen in Cabarrus. Um, Mr. White, would you like to speak to that? Mrs. Carpenter, unfortunately, I do remember the case that you're talking about. And I will tell you since 2013, and, and I would tell you beforehand, but at least since 2013, I would tell you what happens is as long as the department is aware of and has active information about a parent, father or mother, mm -hmm. that person is contacted. It's called reasonable efforts. We have, the department has to make reasonable efforts to keep from asking for custody of that child, and that's to reach out to mother, to father, to grandparents, whomever they may be involved. Now, the difficult aspect of it is sometimes a parent will, will refuse to provide information, will refuse to give the, the parent's name, number, how to contact them, and indicate they don't know anything about it until we get into court, and then that information starts percolating up. So I will tell you, since 2013, when we've started representing the department, we have done reasonable efforts. We have always done reasonable efforts, and we will always do reasonable efforts. I, I, I knew about that, but that, that really bothered me when somebody said, oh, they don't have to notify them, and I thought, oh, that's bad news. It is. We do have to notify. The question is, do we have the information to notify? Mm -hmm. Because okay. sometimes we get first names, but not last names. Sometimes we, it, it is really ironic. Sometimes we, get, we don't even get the true name. So, it, but that's what they're trying to fight through. Thank you so much for, and thank you for all you do because I know it is a struggle and they say, everybody has mentioned it's so important to have these children because sometimes meal wise, that is, you know, you mentioned about the poverty because again, sometimes that's the only, only meal these children sometimes get and it is very important, but we appreciate everything that you, you do and everything because it, it is very very important thank you so much for it and we realize how important it is Ms. Adcock uh, yes I'll just ditto everybody else it's really uh, eye-opening and I think it brings a lot of clarity to 
you know, many schools can be kids' safe place, a place where they know they're going to get a meal, they know they're going to be able to connect with other adults that are safe. Uh, and that just brings, you know, at home that we have to keep these kids in school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for much. being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Sure. Okay, board members, we are going to move on to items under 12.01, which is the consent agenda. May I have a motion that the consent agenda be approved as presented with the um, exception of the calendar uh, revisions? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Blackwell, a second by Mr. Furr. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. Now we will move to our items under 13.01, which is the return to school COVID safety, ga safety guidelines. And I'm going to just open up the floor for discussion. After I, I'm just going to read a motion on the floor and then we can start. Based on the information presented at our last meeting and tonight, I will entertain one of the following two motions that will last until our next business meeting. Number one, motion to be mass mandatory, or number two, motion to be mass optional. Key up, can you please? Will you key up? <laughs> May I ask one question uh, before? Uh, <coughs> Dr. Kapicki had made a comment about days that we were out and half days in January. How many days? I know you had mentioned January, the the days we were out and half days in January. How many days were we out and how many half days do we have in January left? So we, we are off on Monday, January 17th due to the Martin Luther King holiday. Our high school students are being dismissed early this week, and I would ask for Dr. Hill for clarification. It's my understanding is that is because of the final exam schedule. So our students come in, they take the final exams, and then they would go home. So they're not here for the whole day. They're just taking their exams. That's accurate, Dr. Hill? Thank you. And then also on January 18th, the teacher work day, so there'll be no students in school that day. It's just teachers are here that day. Our students will return to school January 19th. Okay, nineteenth. Okay, so those then so that's three days are off, and then you say half days this 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 week for high school. And so would be accurate. It's roughly turns into half days. They're okay. taking their exams and going home. All right, thank you. And can I put a motion on the floor? Absolutely. I would like to. Hey, hang on. Well, we can. Uh, I'll put well, one. Well, let me. Go ahead. If you're going to do that, I actually had the motion here for us. Did you read that? Yeah. Well, the motion to make I it's would either number one or number two. So I'd make a motion we go mass mandate to the end of January uh, with uh, to the end of January with with the recommendation that so we could get the test stay back uh with that since we are right now at 27.2 percent and the, they had said we would probably be at 34.1 percent and this is the recommendation that we were given last week by cha so you're going to need to clean up your motion oh okay <laughs> well that we go mass mandate okay uh, I heard end of January with the recommendation that we get the we return to the test and stay program. Test and yeah, test okay. it. Now you kind of deterred from that, but is that that complete? Well, right? that'd be the gist of it. Okay. And then I can give my. Uh, Madam Chairman, if if we go mask mandate, if that's what the board's prerogative is, the test to stay will come back. As long as we as long as we can manage the numbers, I, I do believe that the. That, the health the health department will support the test to state program for mass mandated. Yeah, as they had as, said they would. Yeah, and, okay. and again, as long as the number, as long as we can manage the number, so the, obviously test to state would bring the quarantines down, um, in theory, and hopefully that would that would be in, in reality too. But is I want to be clear on this. I do believe that that if we're mass mandated, they'll bring test to stay back. But again, if the quarantines as they sit now, some of that's going to be a little unmanageable. We'd have to work our way through that, but it would come back in some form. Okay, so the motion is on the floor. Now I'm going to open it up for 
Actually, do I get a to, will there be a second to Ms. Carpenter's motion? Um, can I just ask a clarifying question? Um, the health department asked for the end of January, but they really asked us for two weeks. Um, what are your thoughts about two weeks? Because that gives us an opportunity for the task force to meet and look at the metrics, and then that can guide decisions on masking, which is what we've said we would do um, based on the, the metrics. What about that? Just a and question. Th that's one reason I said the end of January. They've not met yet, and that's one re I didn't want to go, I'm trying to keep it simple. Uh, that was one reason I wanted to do it through the end of January, and that's one reason I just asked the superintendent, you know, this is a 50-50 thing. We had a lot of people speak against this, and we're looking at the state, 61% are mass, 47 aren't, six are depending on the rate and everything, so it's a 50-50 thing here. Mm -hmm. So trying. let me, let me, let me care, clarify, Ms. Sanders, so that's actually a little more than the two weeks. Are you saying you want to revise the date or that's sufficient for you as far as what she put the motion on the floor? Yeah, I'm asking if you're willing to revise the date for the two weeks, and I guess, and, and this is just my, my opinion here, and you guys can ask questions. I don't know that we'll be having the discussion about the spikes in two weeks. I hope that made sense. I think that this is some layover from the holidays, and I think that that two weeks gives us the opportunity to look, to allow our task force to look at this metrics. And that's what I heard us talking about last week. Now, if you, I don't know, Dr. Kapiki, you may have some other additional information. Do we expect that our task force will be meeting sometime soon to look at this metrics? Because right now we're in two and two, and we don't have a determination of how we deal with that we will be we will be we will bring it we will be bringing the task force together to meet i don't have a date and time right now but i will definitely have met with them before january 31st okay well i'll i'll, I'll, I'll second your motion okay so i have a motion on the floor that we continue we implement mask mandate until the end of january so i'm gonna give a january 31st date with the recommendation that the Health Alliance returns us to the test and stay program. Okay, and I had a motion by Ms. Carpenter and a second by Ms. Sandage. Now I'll open up for discussion and I'll begin with Ms. Adcock. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that I don't understand is, and I'm just going to ask a question, are we asking the school system to prevent the spread of COVID now with um, Omicron in our community? Or are we protecting our children from being infected by an already, already highly effective community? I just, I'm very confused why they took the test to stay program away from us. Um, I just, I, I'm very confused by all of this. And I, I, if I want to put masks back on kids, then I would only do it for two weeks. I would not go to the end of this month. Okay. I'm a, let, let's let everybody speak to your motion okay. first. Okay, um, Ms. Blackwell. Um, I am also equally as, uh, <clears throat> I guess, perturbed might be the better word I, I don't know at this point um, about the test to stay uh, being removed um, we've gone back and forth about this um, we knew that these numbers were going to increase over the holidays COVID is not being spread in the schools and the reason why I know that is because Chuck eloquently came up here and spoke to their cleaning habits School is the safest place for these children to be. Uh, there may be community spread, but I will not put kids in masks in school. That is all. Mr. Furr, will you key up, please? You know, I've, I've talked to a few elementary teachers over the past couple of weeks, and, you know, they've told me how important it was to teach in kids how to read with the mask on it's almost you know it's, it's not there I talked to a fourth grade teacher who 
says her kids are reading on second grade level because of what we've done in the past. Um, you know, as Miss Yost spoke a while ago, and, and looks like everybody on this board has got uh, high praise for her and confidence in her. And when she made this comment that the most sacred constitutional right is a parent to parent their own child. So I think we should let the parent parent their own child and stay out of that. And uh, so, of course, I'm going to vote mass optional like always. Mr. Walter. Okay, I think we ought to do what the health department kind of asked here. It was not completely unreasonable, um, but they had a caveat to what yours says. This says everyone should be masked if unable to be distanced. Um, and then I would have a, another caveat to that um, for our athletes and our performers. Um, I don't think we need to require them to ma mask if it's going to, uh, I guess, hurt the ability to perform their activity. Um, I think that needs to be accepted, uh, an exception. I also think we need to accept our uh, self-contained DC classes for those students that may have a communication problem with the, with the teachers, and I think that needs to be accepted as well, uh, as long as we're, and including the ones in the school tool toolkit. So, um, I think if we can do that, um, I think that's reasonable. Because I think if we look at these metri metrics, and we're supposed to go off the metri metrics, um, we're in the red here for these two, but we're not just in the red. We're eight standard deviations over on, on percent of positive, and we're um, almost 12 deviations on the number of cases in the last 14 days. I don't think we can just ignore that. We've got 1,200 kids that are out. 1,200 students that are, we're, we're telling it's important to be at school, and here we're, we're sending them home, and we can't, I, that's just unacceptable. We got, or let's say here, what was the latest number on te teacher staffing? Almost 400 teachers that are either quarantined, or staff, sorry, not teachers, staff that are 300 in quarantine and 84 that are positive. Um, you know, if we have the mask mandate, as was shown here, um, they don't have to quarantine. A lot of them do, don't. And when we're talking 94% of the people we're sending home they never come down with COVID, we can't do that. We've got to do something. Um, and if it's a two week period, it's a two week period. But, but <clears throat> I think we need to do something and not just allow it to continue. Okay, so did everyone get the chance to speak to uh, Ms. Carpenter? You go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, again, I, I wanted to give some explanation on this. We went from 15.4 to 27.2, and they're talking about now we're looking at 34.1. We were going to mass when we were at 14 point something. So I don't think this is unreasonable to ask for this. The state right now is at 32.1%. Uh, as uh, Mr. Wilder said, just uh, spoke about how many we have in quarantine right now. One of my major concerns is what we talked about for about three hours talking about staff. This is one of the main reasons it's been talked about. Well, it's not our children getting it. We're talking about our staff and what we're facing them with this. If we don't have teachers or we don't have people to be there, it, it may be the staff getting it. That's what we're talking about, to be safe with our staff and and the community in the whole it's it's other people maybe the children aren't getting it or they could be asymptomatic but we have to have the teachers there to teach them you talked about how many student how many staff were gone we have have to have the people there uh one of the things it's not just the health alliance that says this also cdc says mass people also the american academy of pediatrics says mask it's not just that we're looking at other in the other entities that say to do the same thing and we're not talking about that long it is now the 10th we talked about the days that they're out for a half a day they're talked about the days that are going to be gone in in january so we're not talking about that long a period 
we've talked about we have to adjust those metrics. Those need to be adjusted. And to get and have the task force meet, adjust those metrics, and get us some good numbers for us to work with and to have time to do it. Plus, we know this variance. We know it's going to be around for a while. And to let these numbers come down for a while, we're not talking about for a long period of time, and we put a time definite on there. So that's what we gave a time definite. And thank you. Ms. Sandage. Uh, I'm, I'm almost past talking about mask versus optional mask. What we have all clearly stated, and anybody on this board can correct me if I'm stating anything that they didn't say, our children learn best in a school building. Right now, what is being said to us is the only way we can avoid all of these quarantines, all of the teachers and staff being out, all the kids who we just put the data out there who aren't even becoming positive. They're out of school and they're not becoming positive are to mandate mass. That is a small task to ask for to do what we ultimately want to do and what our community has ultimately come in here to that podium right there and told us to do. And we've been talking about get kids in school, get kids in school. We have them in school. Now we've got to allow for them to stay in school. And then to hear we can't even guarantee that because we can't do tests to stay. That tells me that our kids and our staff are going to be quarantined at high numbers yet again. And that is a problem for me. And I'm going to take your word, Rob, um, that, that we can't do that. That's, that's a problem for me. OK. Um, so I want to make a recommendation before I put the vote on the floor. So one of the questions I have is, and we, we, we never thought we were going to be here. <laughs> you know, I want to make that statement very clear. We have heard for almost three years now that every phase of this is going to get us to a place that we will not have to address this. And we're not getting there. You know, we were told it was vaccinations, it was the boosters. So, you know, there's just been so many issues. My question is, we had had, we got a lot of complaints, and Jay and Dr. Picky, you're probably going to have to speak to this, about we, we, are, we are being asked to put a policy, not even a policy, a, a rule in place because it doesn't it's not board policy um, in place that we don't even have a repercussion or a consequence for it so you know when you violate board policy there's a consequence there's a board policy that tells you how you violated it and what the repercussions are and the consequences and the punishments but we're putting something in place so that we were hearing all across the district you know one would send somebody home one would put them out in the hallway one didn't do anything at all we've got a lot of consistent inconsistency you know when you've got parents of kids that have kids in multiple levels high school middle school elementary if they're all addressing it different ways there was just a lot of consistencies if we're going to have to deal with this for i'm not sure how long I just feel like we've got some, to have some type of consistency on what our teachers expected to do with that if they are not adhering to that rule. What are principals being told that they should do if they are not adhering to it? Because we're actually trying to put a, a rule in place that we really probably don't have the legal authority to do. Yes, it's been sent down by Governor Cooper, but we do not have legislative authority to do that. And that concerns me that we don't have the ability to put, what what are we gonna do? What what are they being told that if they don't do it, how, how are they handling it? I think that's one of the things that we now need to really address if we're gonna continue to have this conversation in this boat ever so often. So Jay, Dr. Kapiki, I would really like to have an, an idea of what we're going to do. I, that's what we're hearing. You, you put that in place, but you don't tell us what to do with it. What, if the board votes tonight to go mask mandatory for two weeks, as well, the motion <coughs> is till January 31st. But if it's amended to according to what I heard Mrs. Adcock say, then whatever the time frame, if it's mask mandatory, then what that would be a, um, a decision by this board for Dr. Kapicki to then put a plan of action as to what is the next step, what is the next action, how is it going to be implemented at each one of the high schools, and then it's up to the principals to follow the guidance of what Dr. Kapicki and, and the cabinet has made a decision about what's going to happen. So if a child is not wearing the mask, 
um, then it's going to be the same as well I do not want to it's it may not be an apples to apple but I think it's close if a child is not behaving in class standing up yelling not being respectful to the teacher what are the steps does that teacher take but I think that is how that's going to be handled should be coming from Dr. Kapicki in the cabinet and that's what how that can be enforced now within go ahead but doesn't that have to be a, I know it does have to be approved by board policy so with in all those actions if a child doesn't show up to school we know what happens if a, a child brings uh, some type of weapon to school we know what happens if a child is belligerent to a teacher we know what happens and what the repercussions are because it speaks to it in a board policy you know this doesn't speak to a board policy violation you know it doesn't meet dress code there's no verbiage in there about dress code it's just my concern that if we're going to implement something and it's a rule that we expect people to abide by how are teachers to be consistent or principals in what what they do if they don't do it because how are we implementing something that we don't have a consequence for or a repercussion and it's just everybody's doing whatever they think or their definition of what that should look like i just think that causes a lot of problems and with that you know thinking about as we've spoken about the times that kids aren't in mask so are those truly defined every day it's lunch it's your limited recess it's your mask break um, you know it's the athletic time period you know so if kids aren't wearing them at certain periods of times but yet kids are choosing not to wear them at others you know I, I've heard from teachers that is a big battle so how do they how do they police one piece of that but not the other I would tell you that what I would like to look at is to give me a few minutes to look at the code of conduct about the student see what would apply underneath that because that's how I would initially analyze it um, but I but I do believe if the board makes this decision it would be more of a court of court of course of conduct or the code of conduct about how the students going to respond to whatever the teacher is requesting so can I ask a question hang on just one second Ms. Sanders let me finish so are you saying that's more placed into like an administrative guideline that's what I would say okay. let me okay. look at it and see but okay. yes that's what I would analyze it okay I just feel like rules and process that we put in place it has to align somewhere you know and, and there ha if we're going to continue to deal with it we've got to figure out what we're doing with it when it's not being followed because the answer is not well we don't know and that's what we're having to say you right know, because we don't know how they're handling it and I'm sure that is a Dr. Kapiki you know and his staff decision or you know an update to, uh, to the board but I feel like we need to address that now that we're going this far into having to, to, to vote for this every month yes ma'am so Jay in terms of policy it would probably fall under dress code policy if you meant the board if the board a lot of the board votes tonight to mandate a mask becomes part of dress code <coughs> or it becomes I mean you could tie you could also attach to if a refusal is in the, to disrupt the behavior because if my understanding is if the board passes a mandate it's basically saying that the Cabrera County school system is operating under a mandate that all everyone that comes into the school system has to wear a mask based on the mandate that the board has approved. If we're looking for a policy attach it to, I would say attach it to the dress code. Right. It would be simple to do that and the dress code is already in place, just adding the mask as part of the dress code while the mandate exists. And the mandate doesn't exist, you remove it. Well, I'm not sure we need to take all that on tonight. I just I want that to be part of our discussion at a, a later date. So with that, and the reason I even brought that up is, would the board be willing to have a called meeting uh, in the two weeks time period so that we can look at those numbers and get an update? Or actually, I could add this to the agenda of our work session or our planning session. Maybe that's the better way to do it. Uh, for the board to agree to add an action item to get a COVID update and to revisit the mask mandate. How would that be? So I would remind the board that we get those updates on Monday afternoon. So each Monday afternoon we can update us what the numbers are. Okay. Just as a point of clarification, Dr. Kapicki, is this Monday afternoon coming up is going to be the 18th. So would you get that on Tuesday? Uh, Mr. Basilis, is that accurate? Thank you. And because of the, then the following Saturday would be the 25th if, the 22nd. or 22nd, excuse me. Which would be our timing for the work session. Okay, Ms. Sanders, would you like to make a comment? Just a clarifying question. So my daughter's in high school and she comes into class and she disobeys what the teacher asks her to do. How is that different from the teacher asking you to pull your mask up and you refuse to do it? 
how is that different? That's what that would be my question that, for you to look it into. It may be the point better, like Dr. Kapicki said, it may, the better course may be that it's under the dress code policy as opposed to a behavioral policy. But I'd have to look at that to make certain that it's on, on good, good, strong foundation, if that's what the board <coughs> decides to do tonight. Well, we're not modifying policy. Sir? We're not modifying a dress code policy. Tonight? No. No, no tonight is I'm just whether it's going to be mask mandatory or night. Right, this is the, the whole The question point. then becomes is, how does that get enforced? And that's a decision for another day. And what exceptions are going to be? I'm sorry. Yes, you're and right. And what exceptions, because I'm will not going to agree to it unless we add some of these right. exceptions. Okay. So we probably need to put that on the works or the okay. planning session agenda to have another discussion. Mr. Furr? Yes, even though I won't vote for it, but uh, I would like for that uh, to exclude athletics because you have, you know, we play in with different counties and this is not going to be right for our teams to have masks on and the other teams not. So I think Annapolis or some, I think that's the way theirs is. It's, uh, it excludes like basketball and wrestling. Is that regulated by Could you key up that That's us now. It, it, it used to be state, but now I think it's us. It's what I was told. Oh, so we have to Ms. Carpenter, will you please oh, key up? Jesus. But didn't, didn't you have some exceptions also? Yeah, for artistic performers such as band and such as drama, and then for the EC self-contained classes. Okay, with those I would accept those exclusions if that's acceptable. I mean, that. Are you okay with that, Keisha? So, are are we amending the motion at this point, or are we just she, discussing she's, it? She's just going to add to her motion, which is fine. Add to that motion if that's acceptable to you. I mean. I, I'm I'm fine. And, fine. Well, two, we have to make sure buses. I mean, we have always said well, they're buses. They're always still mandated. Yeah, so our buses are mandated. You're not addressing buses, correct? Okay. So yes. you'd still apply the toolkit, wouldn't you? Because that's what that covers. That. You'd apply the toolkit because that would cover that, and that would also cover the the lunches and all that other stuff. Does the does toolkit apply that? Yes. And can, toolkit can makes I exception for the the eating and the. Yeah. Okay. Miss okay. Adcock. Uh, Ms. Carpenter, will you change that motion for two weeks and then we'll revisit it after two weeks and see where we are with our numbers? What would that date be? The 24th. 24th. We will be meeting on that Saturday the 22nd for the planning session, so we can either add it that day or we could have a meeting on Monday after receiving the information on Saturday. Two weeks would be two weeks from tonight, which would be the 24th. But the 22nd, if we get that information from them on that Saturday. My compromise. I, I would rather wait 30 days. That would get. Yeah, but is the task force going to have time to meet? Oh, excuse me. Is the task force going to have time to meet? I'm sure we can get that in. Well, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can try. Okay. okay. So. I mean, this is only if the task force. That's one reason I wanted to put it out 30 first. Because this is the whole thing, because I want those metrics done. So. Because those metrics are very important to me. If those can't be done, I'm going to say no. Because that, that's, that's a big thing. We've got a real problem with that. We don't have good data. Uh, those metrics are way out of kilter. That's supposed to be, I have had more complaints saying, why are y'all just using, you know, the Health Alliance information? Because we've got poor data. That's, that's not good information. Here you got a task force that's supposed to give us this good stuff, and we don't have good data uh, with the metrics that Ms. we've Car got Carver, put together. I'm going to call the time on the discussion. You're, you have just been added to the task force, so you get to be a part of that. Okay, so remember that. Okay. Oh, right. That's fantastic. Right. I told you that. You no, I haven't heard this. This is news to me today. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, yes, absolutely. So, to your point, Mrs. Carpenter, the data that you're getting is it's good, accurate data. The problem is the, the, the question is whether or not what we're, how we're scaling that data is the question. In other words, what, how we're measuring it is, is, uh, is it, is that effective? 
So the, so the data is accurate and true, but I think you're, what you're saying is that um, it's not the best measurement that we're using to assess how the COVID is affecting the district. So and, I, and I agree, but a perfect example is here we were out of school for two weeks, and when you come back, that data was not, it was good at two weeks before that, but when we got back and needed to make a decision, that data was two weeks old. Understood. So it was not accurate at that time because it was not up to date at that time when I needed to make a decision. So it, you're saying it was accurate, but that was accurate two weeks before that. It was not accurate when I needed to make a decision. Understood. Is that correct? <clears throat> Or am I wrong in no, what I I'm think, saying? No, I, I don't think you're wrong. I think the data that we're giving is accurate at that point in time that we're giving it to you. I just think that the way we're assessing it could be improved upon. So I think on the, on the metrics, we can improve the metrics is what I would say. So I do agree with you with that. But I would rather have data when I get it that day is, is to the point as that it is that day. Uh, you know, like the Health Alliance, they're usually a week behind. Right, <clears throat> and you know it would be a lot better if I could have it what sure. it is that vi sure. in that point in time. Sure. So that's Understood. that'll be great. Thank All right, you. Thank you. Okay, so what we have to decide is number one: when are we going to have the next meeting to discuss the data? I would. That go, is going to be reflective in your motion. I would. I will. I'll. I will compromise and do that Monday. I'll go with two weeks that Monday. Hang on. I really need the conversations to stop. I cannot hear guys. Okay. So let's, let's, I'll give you time if you need to speak to it again, but let me be able to hear. Okay. So now please restate what you just said. I will amend it to do it that Monday after our meeting on Saturday. I, I, it seems like I could get more people to go along with that, that Monday. So, the so two weeks, 24th. And okay. that's really less than two weeks with those days being out. So that should make some people happy. Okay. So you're saying for us to have a meeting on the 24th. Okay. All right. And then this is only in agreement that the Health Alliance returns us to the test and stay program. Okay. Jay, is there anything that you think I need to add? Well, what I heard is that the motion is to go mask mandatory until January the 24th, um, excluding athletics and extracurricular activities. Art, art, artistic performances. I'm sorry? Artistic performances. Artistic performances. Um, and EC self-contained. EC self-contained. And to include and to include uh, test test to stay tool and the school tools account. kit yes and the guidelines of the school tools kit okay so Sarah do you have all that I'll, make sure. I'll write it I will work with Mrs. Hammond okay. to make certain she's got it all right so now we've corrected the motion what about athletics excluding, excluding. athletics excluding. all right so mask we've... mandatory until January the 24th excluding athletics, extracurricular activities, arts, art performances, and EC self-contained rooms, and that test and stay is reinstated. Now there's some exceptions in the school tools kit. So that would be eating and drinking, that type of thing? We just need to say that to, to administer the guidelines of the school's tools kit so that we don't have to pick that apart. So Jay. that everybody is clear about this, this applies to any person that comes to visit the campus. It's not just, it's not teachers, it's not students, it's not, it's each and everybody, visitor, everybody. Okay. Okay, so Dr. Kapiki, with that being said, tell us one more time, who, who kind of <coughs> polices this? Uh, who, who's responsible for policing the mandate? Can I ask one minute to one statement yes. um, while Dr. Kapicki is, is about to talk is that you have policy 4315 
and Port Policy 4316, disruptive behavior, students failing to observe established safety rules, standards, and regulations included on buses and in hallways. That would be a way to enforce it. And then under 41, 4316, endangering the health or safety, it's the student dress code, endangering the health or safety of students or others, of the students or others. So that would include students and teachers and custodians and everybody that I'm forgetting to mention. Okay. So, so that's guess, how it could be enforced. Right. And then the same people would be in charge of making sure that it happens just like any other one of those that has to be abided by. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Okay. So, okay, the motion's on the floor. Ms. Sandage, do you agree to the second of that motion that Mr. White just read? Yes, uh, I'll second. Okay. All right. I'm going to go one more time with discussion or questions, and I'll start with Ms. Adcock. I don't have anything else. Okay. Ms. Carpenter? Ms. Blackwell? I think we have just made this utterly the most confusing thing that has happened all night. I. What about all of the English teachers who can't um, see their children speaking to make sure that they're verbalizing um, the English classes correctly or the Spanish classes correctly? We've put all of these caveats into the, all of this. This is going to completely skew any data that we want to get. So now we've made it sound like it's okay if you don't wear a mask when you're doing athletics, and it's so it's okay if you don't do it if you have an artistic performance, and it's okay, um, you know. But it's okay if if you can't be understood in class, and the teachers are having trouble being able to teach their children because they can't see the words that are being enunciated in their mouths. That to me, this has just made this whole thing more confusing. I, I, I don't really understand the point at this point, except for just to get the Cabarrus Health Alliance to agree to put the test to stay back in place, which should be in place anyway. Thank you. And I guess I guess we need to absolutely put back in there because this was critical last time um, about the exemptions, who fills out the forms and provides the forms for the exemptions for religious and medical, and we failed to put that in there the last time and got called out for that. So where, who, do we need to put that verbiage back in there, Jay? That became an issue the last time we did this. Does that provide that in the school toolkit? I didn't hear that. I have not seen that in the toolkit, and I, I don't either. think in regards to this issue that I'd have, I'd want to look at it, but I don't think that it would call for an exemption. Am I missing something, Jonathan? It's not in the toolkit. Yeah, it's not in the toolkit. So um, how do we address the exemptions, which we got, that was the problem. We did this the very first time was the, how, we didn't have a process in place for that, and the state says that you do have to have a process in place for that. And Mr. John Bassley, Mr. Bassley, maybe that might be a question for you. That was the one thing that we failed and had the problem with the original motion when we did it. If we failed in that, we failed in an awareness of that. We've had that in place since students have been back in school. We've had exemptions for something signed off by a medical professional saying a student needs an exemption because of something physical. It, it is in the toolkit. I mean, it says you're exempt, should not wear a face covering due to any medical or behavioral behavioral condition or disability right so we continue to have that form in place and um we okay, also that's have that's all i needed to yep. know i okay. didn't know if it needed to be a part of the actual motion i know oh. we discussed it before but sure. i wasn't sure if it needed to be verbiage verbiage in the motion jay are you comfortable with what we've okay all right so we'll have a motion on the floor that was read by our attorney i have a second by miss sandage and i'm going to ask for a raise of the hands all in favor for this motion oh i'm sorry yes absolutely mr fur you know, I'm tired of it, but I'm beating this dead horse. But my question, I guess, is to Dr. Kapicki. On, on the test to stay, the health department said that if we go mask mandatory, we can continue to test to stay. Does that, is that their decision or is that the state, or is it the Carolina Duke folks? Who, who makes that decision? It's my understanding that the board approves the mask mandate. You put the mask mandate back into place. We then would have to approach the public health director, which is Dr. Coyle, and ask her if, if she approves um, the Cabarrus County Schools participating in the test of state program. If she gives approval to that, then we're in it. If she does not give approval to it, then we still we, we would not be in the test of program. My understanding is that she has the authority to vote that through or vote that down. So you could pass this this evening and 
I don't want to put words in her mouth. She could say yes or she could say no tomorrow. Um, and and, and that, that's just the bottom line. She's going to have that say. But my understanding is that if we are mass mandated, that she would support the program as long as the quarantines weren't so out of control that we, we could have the personnel that could handle the, the yeah. testing. Right. Okay. Now, my next question is don't, don't, don't you think it's strange that that comes with a deal? The health department is trying to make a deal with us. You put the mask on, you can go back to test and stay. If you don't put the mask on, you don't. And they care about kids in school. If they cared about kids, that wouldn't be a stipulation on whether we put mask on or not. I, I didn't know we was in the in the deal making business with our kids. Sorry. You just made Wait, a deal. Oh. Okay. I'm taking it off the floor, Mr. Walter. Okay, I still think I remember her saying that the test and say wasn't necessary if you had the mask mandate on there. And again, it was, it's for two weeks, so it's not very long. And it's doing something uh, to reduce the number of people we're sending home that need to be in school. I mean, 1,200 kids is just too many. We've got to do something. And if this knocks that number down, and it seems to, according to the stuff that Mr. Vasilis has showed, showed us, uh, we'll be in a better position. Do you have anything else, Ms. Sandage? So CHA explained last week when we talked to them why they would not want us to be in the test and stay um, program if we were re remained mask optional. I think um, we shouldn't, and this is just my personal opinion, um, we shouldn't talk for them right now. And I don't, I don't want to continue to do that. So um, I'm okay with your motion. I think if we could just vote on that, I'd be okay. Okay. The only thing I wanted to add, because of the late hour, uh, Jay, uh, do you, Dr. Kapicki, should we make this effective Wednesday if it passes yeah, versus there, tomorrow? It's not real. It's not realistic to think that we can communicate this all to our public this evening. It's 11 o'clock in the evening, so you, you, you would not be able to begin this tomorrow. So can we add on the? Are you good with adding on the end of that that it begins on Wednesday versus tomorrow because they're going to have a real hard time with this late if it passes to get that word out? Oh, start it tomorrow. Instead. Start it Wednesday instead of tomorrow. Oh, okay. Are you, will you key up? Okay. Yeah, we can start it, yeah, since are it is okay so late okay. instead of starting it today. Okay. Okay. Second. Okay. Ms. Adcock, did you have anything additional? Okay. Okay, the motion has been read. I think everything has been vetted. We have a second. All those in, sa in favor, I want you to um, acknowledge by raising your right hand if you are voting for the motion. So I have a 4-3 with Ms. Adcock, Ms. Carpenter, Mr. Walter, and Ms. Sandage voting in favor, and with Ms. Blackwell, myself, and Mr. Furr voting in against. But motion passes, and it will begin on Wednesday morning. Okay, that is now taken care of. We will move to 13.02 for the calendar revision discussion, and I will turn that over to Dr. Kapiki. So the calendar revision is, is, is fairly simple and straightforward. May 17th would be the primary election date that we're asking the board to approve, and all other um, days on the calendar remain the same. So those days that were originally uncapped will remain uncapped, and those days that were originally capped will be capped. So there'll be no other changes to the to the calendar with the exception of changing the primary date to May 17th, which would be a cap day and teachers would be in session anyway. That's the only that would be a change. So May 17th would be a cap day for teachers. Everything else will remain the same. We're not changing anything else. Or no, whatever was capped or uncapped prior to that would stay the same. Are you ready for questions? Okay. Ms. Atcock? So we're changing the cap days to uncapped days except for that one day. Right. The only change the board would be making right now that you're voting on is that May 17th, the primary day, would be a cap day. Everything else on the calendar would stay the same. They would Those days that were uncapped would remain <coughs> uncapped. So the days in March that, that, that were discussed at the work session to be capped would remain uncapped. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter. Okay. Make sure I... So we decided they're, they're going to be uncapped now, not capped. That's correct. Okay. Cause, okay. That, that's, that's good. Uh, the other thing, 
we had talked about. Now, this is, are we going to have another discussion on the incentive thing, or is this the? Yeah. Oh, okay, yes, so this is not the incentive thing. No, no, okay, so the only the day calendar. we're going to have capped is the 17th then, right? May correct, the that's May. correct. Okay. Ms. Blackwell. No, I'm good. Uh, glad that this is happening. Thank you. Mr. Furr. No, I'm good. Thank you. Mr. Walter. Yeah, I'm just saying glad that we are listening to our teachers and our feedback that we got from last week. Uh, I think it's, you know, obviously our teachers are burdened, and if they can use that time off, there, that's uh, a good opportunity to, to do that. So, thanks. Ms. Sandage. Yay. <laughs> Great statement, and I agree. Ditto the rest of the board. I think we appreciate the teachers even pointing out that that would impact their, their ability to have to ask for extra time off. So we really appreciate that. So that is taken care of. So then I'm going to need a motion. Okay. I make that motion that we accept that recommendation and I second uh, to it. do that. I have a motion by Ms. Carpenter, a second by Ms. Sandage. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we will move to 13.03, which is the teacher's coverage compensation discussion, and I will turn it back over to Dr. Picky, Picky once again. So uh, I would just ask, well, let's keep, let, let's keep this very simple. The only thing I'm asking you to do is to allow us to allow myself, give me the authority to work with Ms. Herndon, our CFO, to develop a compensation system for our teachers and possibly others that are covering classes during teacher prep periods. Um, and I will work with uh, Ms. Hearn and, and make sure that it's we're financially capable to do that. Uh, but I'd like to put that into play as soon as possible and not wait until the next board meeting. I will inform the board of what we come up with um, once we develop it uh, and inform you, but nothing will be done that'll put financial constraints on us without the approval of our CFO. Yes, Ms. Carpenter. Can you also add on there something for the subs, adding something extra for subs that have uh, experience, te what I'm saying, teachers that are retired teachers that have years of experience or something extra for these subs? Because we have, I have gotten numerous times these uh, subs that are retired have a lot of years of experience and they want to maybe sub and it's just not to their advantage to do it so mm -hmm. can you put something like that in that package also we are going to look at incentivizing the substitutes as well okay. thank you board members any other comments or questions miss saying the job again with you uh, so I just asked earlier about us including anyone that covers a class mm -hmm. in this stipend or incentive. That's correct. Okay. And then the other thing, um, I appreciate us identifying that there is an issue and actually doing something about it. And I just want to say again, I appreciate all of our staff for going the extra mile to make sure that we get through this pandemic. Thank you. Mr. Walter. So what are the parameters? Well, again, I don't have those details right now. We have some ideas that we've talked about and discussed. Oh, is this I just over two hundred fifty thousand. I, I I couldn't tell you that right now. I'd have that's why we need some time to discuss that. But what I'm going to say to you is, it'll be we, we will not do anything that's going to put us in any kind of financial peril. We also have ESSER funds that we believe we can use as well. I just have to we have to do our homework to to make sure that what we're saying is, is um, doable. I'm not comfortable approving anything that's going to be more than two hundred fifty thousand without the board making that approval. So I can't give you that authority unless it's under that. Understood. Well, that's going to be a problem because we well, have no we have idea a call, what that we have a call meeting when I get it together too, if you want. So do you want to, so is this okay for the call meeting? Yes, we could definitely, okay. once we get it together, I can, I can inform the chairman of the board. We could have a call meeting to have it approved. Okay. Then I really don't need anything but a consensus to allow the superintendent to move forward with the, okay. Is everyone okay with that? And then we'll add it to the, uh, January 24th meeting agenda. Is that might, good? Might be sooner. I don't, you know. Oh, oh, we'll you talk. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay, yeah. great. Ms. Sandage? I feel like this question is coming, so I'm just going to ask it so we're prepared. Does that go back to some time frame, or does that start when we make that decision? No, it, Can it'll, clarify start, that? Yeah, it'll start the day we implement it. So the day that the board approves will be the day that we implement it. Thank you. 
So thank you. I think that's one of the most innovative and creative <coughs> ideas that we have come up with. And of course, teachers should be compensated if they're covering additional classes and uh, using their planning periods. And I know they are uh, doing a lot of additional duties, so that's great. And we will look forward to hearing that uh, number and that updated report. So with that being said, that concludes the business of the board meeting for tonight. And I would just ask for a motion that the board convene in closed session to consult with an, with an attorney and preserve the attorney-client privilege pursuant to General Statute 143-318-11A3 and to consider confidential personnel matters pursuant to General Statute 143-318-11A6. So moved. I have a motion by Ms. A motion by Ms. Adcock. Second. A second by Ms. Carpenter. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Thank you. And with that, we will say good night to our viewing audience. And then we will see you at our special called meeting that will be held on Monday night, January the 24th, 2022. Good night.